dimensions. Today's date is October 13, 2024. This is the Israeli-Palestinian Confederation simulation. We are proposing a federal government for the people of Israel and Palestine that will be created independently of the Israeli government or the Palestinian government, whether those governments agree to it or not. A democracy for the people in Israel, Palestine, that includes Gaza, the West Bank, and Israel, 14 million people who will elect a federal government with a president and vice president and with 300 parliament members. And the election will take place independently and separately without the assistance or interference of the Israeli or the Palestinian government. So that it is clear we are not proposing the dismantlement of the Israeli or the Palestinian governments, even though those governments have failed to give peace to the people of Israel and Palestine, and even though those governments are not elected by the people of Israel and Palestine. We understand that they have the political, the military, and the economic power in the area, and we take that into consideration. We do not oppose one state, and we do not propose one state. We do not oppose two states, and we do not propose two states. We think that the people of Israel and Palestine, who will elect parliament members in the area of Gaza, the West Bank, and Israel, will be in a better position to decide all policies issues, including whether to have one state, two states, what to do about the Palestinian refugees, um, and other issues, including Jerusalem, security, etc. We believe that the people who are elected by the people of Israel and Palestine are in the best position to make those decisions. We are not making any policy recommendations. What we are offering and what we are recommending is a system of government in light of the existing reality. You can see our website at ipconfederation.org and you can read the constitution because the federal government that we are proposing is based on a constitution. The constitution has already been written. It is possible to amend the constitution again by the parliament members. The constitution is available in three languages, Arabic, Hebrew, and English. And it discusses the system of government that we are proposing, a federal government with three branches, a legislative branch, executive branch, and a judicial branch, all for Palestinians and Israelis together as equal for the purpose of making peace and giving prosperity to the people of Israel and Palestine. I hope you read the Constitution. We will discuss parts of the Constitution in our simulation today. My name is Joseph Avisar. And you could reach me at josephavasar at gmail.com. Our guest today is Andre X. Andre immigrated to Israel, Palestine from Russia and became a solidarity activist in the occupied West Bank. At some point, I felt it was my responsibility to do something about it, he explained. After seeing the conditions the Palestinians live in, Andre joined human rights activists who provide protective presence to vulnerable communities in the West Bank. The activists stay in Palestinian villages under assault of the settlers and the army, working to prevent and record human rights violations. He has a large following 
on social media for his video reports from various locations in the West Bank. We invite people with all political uh, views, uh, whether they are pro-Israel or, or pro-Palestinians, uh, conservative or liberal, we invite everyone to discuss our formula for peace and to stress test our formula for peace. I met with Andre about a week ago and um, we agreed on uh, several legislations that Andre feels is are important to discuss in today's simulation. Um, we have more guests coming on uh, October 21st. I will actually have a simulation in person with the students at Claremont College, the students of Mark Jurgensmeyer. Uh, I've done that many times before. Professor Jurgensmeyer is a strong supporter of the IPC and the idea of a federal government. And I wanna thank him for allowing me to present to his students. This time it will be an expanded version so the more students can come and, and, and you can also join um, at Claremont College. It's a beautiful college, excellent setting. And uh, we are inviting more faculty to come in uh, 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 to join the simulation. Uh, on October 27, we will have Nizar Farsak. He's a lecturer at the Elliott School of International Affairs and a trainer on leadership, negotiations, and advocacy with 20 years of experience across the Middle East and North Africa. On um, November 10, we will have uh, Avner Dinur, who is a secular theologian, lecturer of Jewish studies at Sapir College, Israel, and bar -Ilan University. On November 24th, we will have Rami Aman, who is a Palestinian journalist and a peace activist in the Gaza Strip. And on December 8th, we will have Yanis Varoufakis, who, who was the foreign minister of finance of the country of Greece. We are not making any proposals on how the federal government should uh, act and what its policy should be. The simulations that we are conducting, the purpose of that simulation is to demonstrate how a federal government could thread the needle. What does it mean? It means that it could pass legislation that neither the Israelis nor the Palestinian governments will be able to veto because if they try to veto the legislation, they will lose legitimacy nationally and internationally. We are not saying that the federal government should pass the legislation we are proposing. We are just demonstrating how a federal government for the people of Israel and Palestine could thread the needle, but they are free and they are obviously going to pass their own legislation. We are asking you to respect our process and to allow us to explain the federal government that we are proposing. And we are encouraging you to ask questions. Our uh, uh, member Nasir, who, will be uh, uh, watching the, the chat. We're asking you to put all the questions on chat and Nasir will be conveying all the questions to us. And in addition, he will try to translate all the comments that you are making into a question. So we wanna have a productive session where we can explain the process of a federal government, how it will be created and how it will function. So Nasir will tell us what the questions are. So put the questions on chat. And if you have comments, he will try to um, 
interpret those comments into a question. Nasir, could you say hi, please? Hello, everybody. And I put something in the chat just with the questions is we, we want to stay on topic and regarding the legislations and what's being presented. And in the end, we have a general discussion. So if you can save your general questions for then, because a lot of them will be answered during the presentation. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Nasir. Um, this is a two minute video that explains the IPC. Um, let me play it. The conflict between Israelis and Palestinians has endured for generations. And instead of time healing the wounds, it's only caused the anger to fester and the violence to grow. But what if there was a way to alleviate the tension? Something that may not outright solve every problem, but at least create a forum that encourages a peaceful compromise. Welcome to the Israeli-Palestinian Confederation, a common third government between the Israeli and Palestinian citizens specifically designed to foster peace, tolerance, and economic prosperity between the two nations. Here's how it works. First off, both Israel and Palestine will keep their respective governments. Israelis Knesset and the Palestinian National Authority will remain unchanged. The Israeli-Palestinian Confederation, IPC, will be a third entity acting as a unifying agent between the two. The IPC will comprise 300 parliament members elected from 300 districts in Israel, the West Bank, and Gaza. Above them will preside a president and vice president, one Israeli and one Palestinian. In order for the IPC to pass a law, it will require a 55% majority from its Israeli representatives, as well as a 55% majority from its Palestinian representatives, thereby preventing either side from monopolizing the legislature. Of course, the IPC won't undermine the political power of either the Israeli or the Palestinian government. At any time, Israel or Palestine may veto a law passed by the IPC. If neither side vetoes, the law is passed. And the two nations are another step closer to resolution. Please help us make this a reality. The Israeli-Palestinian Confederation. We might speak different languages, but we all mean the same thing. So we are actually going to be um, simulating what was in that movie, on that short movie. I'd like to take a short survey at this time, which we will compare to another survey at the end of the simulation. Please vote as a group. Uh, do you support a federal government for the people of Israel and Palestine? At this time, please vote. Okay, 10 more seconds. Okay, um, please pu publish the votes. 28 out of 29, 97% voted yes. Did you support a federal government? One person out of 29 voted no, which is um, 3%. Uh, I know that some of the people here are not able to vote either they're on the phone or their computer does not allow them, but I think that we have a good picture of, uh, and hopefully by the end of the simulation, we will be able to convince the person who voted no to change his mind. Uh, we are defining confederation and federal government in the exact same way, based the definition is our constitution. So if you say, are we a federal government or a confederation? We say we are both because um, uh, uh, definitions change and we choose to fix the definition based on our constitution, which is at ipconfederation.org. This is the heart of the simulation. And that's certain assumptions needs to be made in order to conduct the simulation properly. And I discussed that with Andre. The first assumption is you will have to assume that we were able to obtain major funding for one year long campaign to promote 
the idea of a federal government to explain to the people of Israel and Palestine the benefits of a federal government, especially in light of the, fa of the failure of their own government to make peace and to give security to the Palestinian and the Israeli people. So you will have to assume that we were able to create a platform for Palestinians and Israelis to vote and to be elected for parliament and for president. You will also have to assume that 14 million people with the exclusion of children were given the opportunity to vote. That is in the area of Israel, the West Bank and Gaza. You will also have to assume that we just concluded the election and 5 million people voted, 3 million Palestinian voted, and 2 million Israeli voted in the election. You will have to assume in this simulation that the president received 1.5 million votes, and you'll have to assume that me, Joseph, was elected as president. It makes it easier for me to conduct the simulation uh, assuming that I am the president so that it's clear I never intend to run for president. I'm not even qualified under the constitution to run for president because uh, even though I'm Israeli citizen, I'm not a resident of Israel. And in order to run and in order to be elected, you have to be both uh, president and resident of Israel, Palestine. It's also in order to be to vote. Um, so, but it makes it easier for me to conduct the simulation if I am acting as the president. You will also have to assume that a Palestinian lady was elected uh, vice president by 1.3 million votes, and she will become um, president in two years, and I will become vice president. You will also have to assume that 300 parliament members were elected in 300 districts. That's in the area of Gaza, the West Bank, and Israel. Combined, 300 parliament members were elected. Each parliament member represents a district of 47,000 people. Now, if you have any questions regarding those assumptions, please put them in the chat, and Nasir will convey those questions. Also, if you have comments, he will try to um, uh, translate those comments into questions. Um, so... Nasir, do we have any questions from the audience regarding those assumptions? There's a question about the remaining 2.2 million votes went to other candidates um, from Nizar. Correct. Uh, yes. So 1.5 million went to uh, elect the president. 1.3, that's 2.8 million. The rest went to other candidates. There were probably many candidates for president. Uh, so, yes. Any other questions? No, not related to this. Okay. So, um, I, I already contacted Jeff and asked him to act as Jeff Warner. Jeff, are you here to act as Israeli Prime Minister in this simulation? And Saeed Aziz as the President of Palestine. Jeff, are you here? Okay, Anna. Anna, are you willing to be the Israeli Prime Minister? Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, hi, good evening to you, Yosef. Um, in fact, I raised my hand for the question. You said that we can place a question. I'm sorry, I, I missed your question, Anna. I apologize. I, I skipped over it. Um, that, we'll go, go. That, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, if you want, I've I can answer. Okay. Yes. Okay. I, Anna's question was about under which uh, criteria factors would the districts be formed, and I think that uh, th this comes up every meeting. So, I think okay. the map. The, the 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 districts are each district has forty seven thousand people, so if you have fourteen million people. The district will be created by computer algorithm uh, to allow uh, 
each district to be separate and to have a, a candidate for parliament. So if, let's say district number one will be in Southern uh, Gaza. Israel uh, district number two will be right next to it. And number three next to it, et cetera, et cetera. All the way to the entire area of Israel and Palestine based on 47,000 people in each district. Now, thank you, thank district you very much. That would be an equal distribution according to population. Thank you. Correct. correct. Um, all right. Um, I I don't see Jeff here. Uh, uh, Nasir, are you here? Uh, uh, Saeed, yeah, I'm here. Are you um, also, the uh, question regarding the uh, the right to vote, it's only for people who reside in the country, correct? For citizens who live abroad? Right. Citizens okay. who, vote, who live abroad but do not reside cannot vote. So I am a citizen of Israel. I am not a resident of Israel or Palestine. Therefore, I will not be able to vote. This is not a Palestinian government. It's not an Israeli government. It's a federal government for the people of Israel and Palestine. The people that are responsible for the Israeli people or the Jewish people is the Israeli government. The people that are Israel, the government that is responsible for the Palestinian governments, uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, the Palestinian people worldwide is the Palestinian government. But we are a federal government for the purpose of making peace in the area of Israel and Palestine. And this is the area in the West Bank, Gaza, and Israel. And I'm asking you as uh, audience in this um, um, simulation to decide whether you are a Palestinian parliament member or Israeli parliament member and whether and what area you represent. Do you represent the area of uh, a, a certain uh, city or village uh, in, uh, in Gaza, the West Bank, Israel, Tel Aviv, Jerusalem? I'm asking you to remain intellectually honest and to decide uh, what is your affiliation in terms of being a parliament member. So I'm asking you to be a parliament member and to make your choice. Please make your choice at this time. Dan, can you put the vote? I don't see the vote for some reason. Dan, okay. Please make your one choice. Either you are a Palestinian parliament member or Israeli parliament. Who is the Palestinian president? Uh, Saeed Aziz. Ah, uh, Saeed. Okay, okay. Saeed, are you here? Yes, I am. Okay, and is uh, Jeff here? We need someone to volunteer to be uh, uh, Israeli prime minister. I'm always happy to be one. Okay, Giacomo. Terrific. Thank you. Okay, all right, so we have published a vote. We have 20 Palestinian parliament members, and we have 13 Israeli parliament members. So from now on, you are you you have the right to vote because you have been elected as Israeli and Palestinian parliament members, and you have to decide what area you represent and remain intellectually honest. And, and, and when you vote, you need to see what's good for your district in relation to the legislation. Now, the Israeli and the Palestinian, uh, the Israeli prime minister and the Palestinian uh, uh, president are not allowed to vote because you represent a separate government. You are not part of our government. You will be given a veto power, but you are not allowed to vote. We are a separate and independent government from your government. Remember that 
some of the districts may be mixed districts. So if you are an Israeli parliament, uh, uh, parliament member, you may be in an area that it has both Palestinians and Israelis. The same for Palestinians. You may be in the area that has Palestinian and Israelis. And when you vote, you need to take into consideration the benefit of your vote to your particular district. All right. So now that we have a president and we have a parliament, uh, we need to ratify the constitution. Uh, Charles, could you please read the constitution? We believe that Palestinians and Israelis are entitled to equal rights under the law and guaranteed human rights and freedom. The Israeli-Palestinian Confederation does not intend to supersede or supplant the Palestinian or Israeli governments, nor to abrogate or undermine any agreements between those governments. We recognize the need to work with the Israeli and Palestinian governments. Our purpose is to resolve conflicts and to expand the relationship between the Palestinians and Israelis in a fair and equitable manner. We believe in equal rights under the law, guaranteed human rights and freedom for all. We voluntarily give the legislatures and the governments of Israel and Palestine veto power over legislation we pass relating to the domain of control of those governments. We believe in the separation of power between the legislative and executive and judicial branches. We believe in the creation of a permanent secular government for all the people residing in Israel and Palestine. We believe in having a separate judicial branch relating to IPC legislation with Israeli and Palestinian judges with a system to avoid biased decisions based on nationality. So under the constitution, the Israeli and the Palestinian governments can decide whatever they want in terms of any issues uh, constitutionally, we are required to accept their uh, agreements between themselves. Uh, we do not intend to undermine the Israeli or the Palestinian governments. Uh, and we give them a veto power relating to issues that violates their sovereignty. Before I go to Andre uh, for his comments, uh, if any of you have any questions regarding the Constitution, put, put them in the chat. Otherwise, um, please, you need to ratify the Constitution, the Palestinian and the... Uh, so let's go to the Palestinian parliament members. Please ratify the Constitution, Palestinians only. Now, remember, you were elected based on your acceptance of the constitution and therefore you must accept the constitution at this time you cannot uh vote no or refuse to ratify the constitution if you do so you will be expelled from the from the parliament and the person who received the second number of votes in your district will be elected instead of you provided he or she accepts the constitution okay please uh publish the vote 100% of the Palestinian parliament members voted in favor of this legislation. Let's go to the Israeli parliament members. Uh, please ratify the constitution. Do you support the Israeli-Palestinian Confederation constitution? Israeli parliament members who were elected, you must ratify the constitution because you were elected by the people promising them that you are accepting the constitution. All right, let's uh, publish the vote. 100% of the Israeli parliament members voted in favor of the constitution. Um, Nasir, do we have any questions from the audience regarding the constitution? Regarding the constitution, no. All right, let's go to Andre. Andre, uh, your comments or questions regarding the constitution. Hi. Uh... Good to be here. I am Andre. Can you hear me well? Yeah, we hear you fine. Fantastic. Um, yeah, about the Constitution, I think uh, I very much like the reiterated several times focus on the um, entitlement to equal rights under the law. 
and human rights and freedom to everybody residing uh, between the river and the sea. I think that is that, that is fundamental to any kind of solution towards any kind of movement towards a solution um, for for the land. Um, one concern that I have is the not undermining or superseding the Israeli and Palestinian governments, uh, given that um, I believe that to get to the point where it becomes important um, to <clears throat> uh, where the main issue becomes creating um, a uh, an equitable space, uh, I believe in in order for that to happen, the Israeli apartheid system, which is functional between uh, the, in the entire territory between the and the sea, uh, needs to be superseded, abolished, and um, completely removed. I believe that it is uh, it is impossible to create an equitable, equitable space and impossible to move towards a peace process without dismantling the apartheid state. Um, so that that would, what, what my concern would be uh, with um, how how to get to um, uh, to how to resolve the conflict between the article of the constitution, which uh, uh, which promotes equal equality for Israelis and Palestinians and whoever else uh, lives in the territory, um, the conflict with the not superseding the uh, Israeli uh, government, which is currently officially and legally enforcing the opposite of uh, equality under the law. So you suggest that we uh, remove from the Constitution our uh, our uh, agreement not to undermine the Israeli or the Palestinian governments. Or should we? Do, do you think that, uh, that? Do you think our goal should be to undermine the Israeli or the Palestinian governments, or both of them? I think that in order for the spirit of the constitution, which is based on equality under the law, to succeed, uh, there needs to be first the uh, the Israeli apartheid system needs to be abolished. So my question is, I guess it's more of a question than a suggestion. Is that how are these points uh, reconciled? Because in my mind, they are irreconcilable. Well. We think that the Israeli and the Palestinian governments are the problem. Not, they're not the solution. And we think that they are not legitimate governments by because they haven't been elected by the people of Israel and Palestine. But on the other hand, we feel that they are too strong politically, militarily, economically. And um, if if our goal would be to undermine those governments, um, we will not be able to come into reality and um, we will not be able to have elections and we will be considered a um, subversive organization and uh, we will not be able to achieve anything. Now, we do not, we are not against one state or two states. And we do not propose one state or two states. We think that it would be up to the parliament members to make those decisions. So I hope I answered your question. Do you have any comments in reply to what I... Uh... I I, I completely understand that uh, in order for the system to be implemented, that it would be a requirement to um, uh, to not supersede or and, and to not uh, undermine the uh, Israeli slash Palestinian parliaments and governments. Uh, I'm, I still have a major concern with how that would um, affect the implementation of the of the equality uh, in the entire land between the river and the sea, um, which I guess remains to be remains to be seen. So far, in my mind, it feels like the um, the the point, the article of the constitution, which um, makes it so that we can't um, undermine the Israeli government, uh, in my mind, that makes it impossible to implement equality. But maybe that will change with, okay. with time. All right. Um, then uh, I have the on my screen. I have these uh, all these votes. Uh, is it possible to 
uh, remove that because uh, I think you just have to X them. Just X them. Yeah, just X them because I don't see them. Okay. Um, I, I can I ask a question? Um, because Andre uh said something interesting in and is that I feel that maybe he's saying that he wishes the constitution to kind of strive for something better rather than accommodate the present because maybe maybe that's what is that what you're trying to say Andre like you're saying that like like there should be a parameter of like maybe more equality international law and that the constitution should strive that to drag the current Palestinian Israeli governments to that rather than accommodate to what they are now uh, in a sense, it's just that my concern that even so, if we snap our fingers and this is implemented, then this line that uh, prevents us from uh, intervening in the, the government affairs, um, it will prevent everything else from actually turning uh, from into from theory into practice. Because currently there is no currently there there is a system of uh, which completely uh, goes against any idea of equality. Uh, and that's, in my mind, in order for us to get to the point where we can build actual equality, this system needs to be dismantled fully. Uh, I don't know if there is a proposal, like if there is a way through this system to get there. I don't see it yet. Maybe there is. But uh, yeah, in my mind, the, the apartheid system needs to be dismantled first, and then we can strive towards, uh, towards building partnership and equality. When you say the apartheid system, you mean the Israeli government needs to be dismantled? Yes. And um, how do you propose dismantling the Israeli government? That's uh, that, that's a very big question, which, which, which is probably beyond the, the scope of, uh, of this conference. OK, so we discussed the um, the statement that perfection is the enemy of good. And in my opinion, when you say, well, it would be perfect if we uh, dismantled the Israeli government, um, actually, um, that's the enemy of what we are proposing because we are saying we realize that we cannot reach perfection, but we can reach something close to perfection. And even though it's not perfect, it's it's in the right direction. And it will make the Israeli government eventually and the Palestinian government eventually less and less relevant. And that's the most that we can reach at this time. Uh, Nasir, are there any questions? I see hands raised. Uh, there, there, the, the problem is that some of these questions are, are going into things like, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I'll let them ask him because I'm, I'm, there's a bunch of chatter in the, in the chat box um, because Anna's questions are kind of going back to, go ahead, Anna. Go, do you want to ask your question real quick? Because you, you're asking like three different questions and I don't want to, Maybe is she people. asking questions regarding the Constitution? Yes, yes, they are, Joseph. Although I don't mind if I don't say, uh, you know, I don't vocalize my questions because Andre has started something and he has expanded very well on all the issues that I think we all here t t today, we share our thoughts, as wishes and my questions actually were Anna, what is your guarantee... question we need to move on we have because a lot. it seems more like comments yes, we're I'm, gonna have I'm time on for to comments my question i'm on to the essence of my questions okay put your how question in the chat how can we guarantee that the right to return the right to return is something is a very huge parameter a very important factor for the equitable shares to be established in the confederation if we don't allow for the right to return, then the handful of Palestinians that have stayed in the area and are staying actually in very severe and harsh conditions, and that's a fact, it's reality, uh, it's not imagination, then they're not going to be alive, first of all, or able to prove identity and then vote. So how can we guarantee the equity on this scenario? Nasir, so what is the question? Her, her question is, it was in regards to about how does the IPC work for the right of return? And I did answer it in the chat. The Things like immigration policy, the right of return policy is done by the governments. So the government of Israel over its affairs and the government of Palestine over its affair. So that that's the because 
That's how I explain it to her. Well, sure. it, 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 we do not guarantee anything. We are creating a a, a federal government with uh, parliament members, and it would be up to them to decide by a process of election, by a process of voting and compromising all the issues. And regarding the right of return, we're actually going to be dealing with that. All right, let's, uh, okay, so let's go to the next issue. And that is, um, so we passed the legis, uh, we, pa we, we, we had an election, we voted we for 300 parliament members, we elected a president and, and vice president. And rather than being somber about it, we should celebrate because this is a momentous occasion. Think about it. We were able to do what was never done in the history of humanity, which is to have a democracy in the area of Israel and Palestine, a democracy that's separate between religion and government. Our election undermines the existing government's use of fear and hate to justify their action. It removes the collective stigma against Israelis and Palestinians, that we are not able to make peace, that we are uh, people that want to fight each other forever. It provides huge political capital to the president and the vice president and to the parliament. And it compels the governments all over the world, including the Israeli and the Palestinian governments and the government and organization to pay attention to us and to participate and contribute. So congratulations. We have done what was never done in the history of humanity, and we should celebrate that. Our first order of business is granting a veto power to the separate governments. Libby, could you please read the, the legislation? Libby. The Confederation is the government of the entire population of Israel and Palestine from the river to the sea. We recognize the Palestinian and Israeli governments and are seeking their cooperation to implement our vision for peace by giving them a veto. We will do our utmost to satisfy the essential needs of each government. We are pleading with the Palestinian and Israeli public to understand that while we would like to pass the best legislation possible to improve their lives, under these constraints, a perfect legislation is not possible. We hereby bestow a veto power relating to legislation affecting sovereignty to the following, the government of Israel on issues in which it is indispensable, the Palestinian government on issues in which it is indispensable, in the event of changes in the entirety of the Israeli or Palestinian governments, this legislation may be amended or repealed subject to the IPC Constitution. The Parliament will decide on indispensability. Vetoes may be bestowed individually or collectively. So we are the only legitimate government in Israel and Palestine but we give a veto power to the Israeli and the Palestinian governments on issues that violates their sovereignty. What does it mean? If the issues that we vote about, uh, about uh, make the Israeli and the Palestinian government indispensable, then we give them a veto power. Example, this is just an example. If we, if we pass legislation relating to the use of land or police force or removal of the wall, then the governments of Israel and Palestine are indispensable. However, on issues that relate to our budget, to ratifying the constitution or appointing judges or ministers, they are dispensable and they have no veto power. Why do we give them a veto power? Because it provides a safety net to both sides. It makes them much more likely to participate and accept the federal government. It incre increases the likelihood of Israelis and partic uh, Palestinian participation. It decreases the Israeli and the Palestinian government's opposition to the federal government. It removes any claims that we are a subversive, 
that we have subversive intentions to undermine the Israeli and the Palestinian government. And it gives legal protection to the candidates so they will not be arrested by the Israeli or the Palestinian governments as being subversive. It compels the IPC, it compels us, the federal government, to thread the needle, to find the least objectionable legislation to the Israeli and the Palestinian governments. Does anyone have any questions? If you have any questions, put them in the chat. Yeah, we have we have a question. What does it mean um, that vetoes may be bestowed individually or collectively? It, it, it means that we may decide to only give it to one government and not the other, meaning that one government is indispensable and the other government is dispensable, depending on the issue. So uh, we don't have to give it to a, a, a veto power to a government that uh, is dispensable. Um, let's take a vote on this uh, legislation. Palestinian parliament members, please vote. Palestinian parliament members, please vote. Do you agree to give a veto power to the separate governments? Dan, can you put the vote? I don't see the vote for some reason. Yeah, there's no vote. Dan, can you put the vote, please, regarding... I don't know what happened to Dan. Dan, can you put... The... Dan, can you please put the vote? I don't think Dan's online. Oh no, he is. He's on. Yeah, he, he's on. Dan, he's can online. you put, please put the vote on on the Dan? Can you please put the vote on veto power? I know that he uh, has some issues with his uncle. Uh, it may be taking care of him. Uh, Dan, could you please put the vote on? All right. Uh, well, let's wait for Dan. Does anyone have any questions regarding the veto power? Okay, veto power. Is a uh, Palestinian parliament members please vote? We need fifty-five percent of the Palestinian parliament members to vote. Publish the vote. Okay. 92% of the Palestinian parliament members voted in favor of this legislation. Let's go to the Israeli parliament members. Israeli parliament members, please vote. And this is, by the way, we see consistently in every simulation, all these legislation almost pass regularly. Um, publish the votes. 100% of Oh, 92% of the Israeli parliament members voted in favor of this legislation. Um, so let's go to Andre. Andre, uh, your comments regarding this legislation. I think I've raised the main concern that I have with this the, in the comments on the Constitution. Um, and the concern here is not, uh, like, I agree with you uh, on the point of better is the enemy of good and uh, it makes sense that we, we, I think we're all trying here to get to one future where there is an equitable reality for everybody who lives in this land between the river and the sea. Um, the concern here that I have would be, does this system actually move us towards that or does it improve uh, some, local, um, some local conditions in certain regards? Um, because it, it has... S systems can uh, also, while they, they improve stuff on the ground, they can actually reinforce the larger systems of oppression. And my concern here would be that um, while trying to work towards uh, an equitable reality, while providing a veto to, uh, to, the, uh, to the existing government, uh, that would reinforce uh, and help legitimize, normalize the... A system of um, the system of apartheid implemented by Israel. So the, the concern is this, the same as as it, as it was with the um, with the constitution because I think this is the 
the issue that we're talking about, the, the veto, the um, not undermining the authority of the Israeli state. All right. So are you saying that if we give a veto power to the Israeli or the Palestinian government, they can use it in a manipulative way to undermine the, the entire process? To undermine the entire process? To, uh, I, I believe that they would be able to uh, stop dead in its tracks the effort to uh, get to an equitable reality. Uh, given that the Israeli uh, system, the, the Israeli government, the Israeli state, uh, has no actual interest in equality, and it has been uh, enforcing a system of apartheid since its inception. And if it has a veto power, then it would be able to keep enforcing it for as long as it wants, because any kind of uh, move towards the dismantling of the apartheid would be uh, an issue in which the Israeli government is indispensable. Uh, Andre, this is a simulation, and we are simulating that 5 million people have voted. Mm -hmm. Giving that uh, fact for this simulation, if you accept that as a fact, and if you accept the fact that 300 parliament members have been elected, and if you accept the fact that a president was elected, and a constitution was passed. Do you think that the Israeli or the Palestinian governments will be able to ignore those facts? Or will they have to play ball and and participate and 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 not be able to ignore this momentous fact? I think this is a very big question, and given that uh, I believe nothing of the sort has ever been uh, implemented, and it's very difficult to predict these things. But uh, at the same time, I believe that there is actually a good chance that they would be able to ignore it, because besides just the power that is vested in a government, in a representative democracy, by the, it, by the electoral choices of the public, uh, the power of the state is reinforced by the violence that it can enact on its own population. Um, and uh, as Weber described the government in general at the end of the 19th, early 20th century as um, a, an entity with a monopoly on violence. And uh, given that in the state, uh, at the stage uh, uh, we're, talking, um, we're talking about now, uh, the, the IPC has no capability for violence, while the Israeli state has the capability of, great of a great amount of violence, as, as, we're, seeing, uh, as we're seeing currently. So it is, I think that it is entirely possible that they would be able to ignore it completely. But I don't know. It's difficult to, to predict these things. All right. Okay. Uh, let's go to the uh, uh, substantive um, legislation that you suggested that you want to speak about is teaching tolerance and understanding. Um, Charles, could you please read this legislation? <clears throat> Both educational systems, making both sides aware of the history and political narrative of both sides in both public schools, devote a certain number of hours for both sides to teach the history of the Israelis and the Palestinians, prioritizing teaching Arabic and Hebrew in public schools to achieve proficiency of both languages by Israeli and Palestinian students, create a mutual task force to ensure the teaching of both languages, educators to draft textbooks together and arrange for a regular exchange of teachers, public media on both sides to provide fair and equal coverage daily for teaching tolerance, IPC as a facilitator to ensure that both sides are fairly represented. We hereby submit this legislation to the Israeli government and the Palestinian governments. We bestow upon them a veto power which they may be exercised in the next 60 days. All right. Do you... Uh, parliament members or the audience, you have any questions regarding this legislation? Please put them in the chat. Nasir, are there any questions in the chat regarding this legislation? Okay, I, I don't hear anybody asking. I don't hear Nasir or um, so. Let's have the. Uh, excuse me, I have the same uh, issue, like about this veto power. 
So everything that we suggest could easily be vetoed. So then we can keep on going, keep on going, and we get nowhere. We go around in circles. Are you you're saying that everything will be vetoed? I am saying there's a potential of it being vetoed, and then what we're we're trying to do as a overall governing authority is not getting implemented. So by giving pe being giving veto power, everybody can say, no, we're not doing this. No, we're not doing this. No, we're not doing this. And then every suggestion that we make doesn't actually, um, you know, get done. Yeah. yeah, I understand what you're saying. What, what we, we believe is that the Israeli and the Palestinian governments have uh, political considerations. They cannot <laughs> ignore 5 million people voting. They cannot ask their people to go to uh, to fight wars and to uh, ignore the possibility of peace. They are able to do it in the current constellation of Israelis versus Palestinians. But when we have a federal government for the people of Israel and Palestine together, it creates a completely different reality. And it would be very difficult for the Palestinians and the Israeli governments to ignore legislation that answers their concern and gives uh, uh, peace to their people. Uh, let's go to uh, Palestinian parliament members. Please vote on this legislation. Palestinian parliament members. Okay, we need 55% of the Palestinian parliament members voting, publish the vote. 93% of the Palestinian parliament members voted in favor of this legislation. Let's go to the Israeli parliament members, please vote. While they're voting, just want to remind everybody that we that they cannot control uh, when the voting comes up. So if you're a Palestinian person, vote for the Palestinian time. You'll also get another way to vote when it's the Israeli time. Just X out that and don't vote. So this is just to remind you, because I some people mentioned that in the chat that it's coming up for both. So everybody gets the chance to vote, but only vote when it's your turn to vote. Otherwise, X out, please. Israeli parliament members voted, published the vote. 100% of the Israeli parliament members voted. So now let's see if the Palestinian president is able to veto this legislation and ignore the people of Israel and Palestine who passed legislation. Mr. President of Palestine, are you going to veto this legislation? President of Palestine. No, Saeed, I'm not going to veto it. I agree with it. Okay, let's go to the Prime Minister of Israel. Mr. Prime Minister, are you going to veto this legislation? Well, I am a right-wing uh, uh, politician, and I, quite frankly, hate all Palestinians. Therefore, I would like to veto this. However, I have a lot of trouble with my coalition right now, and there are some key partners that want to leave. And I have been lobbied by some um, human rights groups inside Israel that they promised that they will get enough votes in the Knesset to keep me out of jail if I do not veto this. And as a result of my pure political expediency, I have decided to go with this solution, so I will not veto it. All right. Thank you. <laughs> well, what about the benefit for the people of, of uh, Israel? <laughs> And for I don't the, believe in this at all. I only do it to stay out of jail. Okay, so you do it for your own uh, uh, personal reasons. All right. Okay, uh, let's go to um, Andre. You've seen this played before you. Uh, the Israeli prime minister has a personal reason not to veto it. The, the president of Palestine believes in it. Uh, what are your thoughts? I mean, the main thought is that uh, I believe that this is one of the most important things. This is absolutely essential in the long-term uh, process of uh, building a future for 
uh, for Palestine slash Israel. And the, the teaching of uh, actual history, which has been sent heavily centered uh, in, um, in the educational system here, which I've seen many times by speaking to people who just got out of high school and don't know what Nakba is, um, it's, uh, I think that it is absolutely material for, for building a future. At the same time, I do believe that it is, um, um, it, it is a long-term thing uh, rather than a short-term thing because, again, I don't think that the problem of the land is a conflict between Israelis and Palestinians, uh, be it a physical one or an ideological one or a misunderstanding of history. The problem is the, uh, is the system of oppression, which, uh, which, which doesn't really depend on what people believe. It uh, more so depends on what laws are used and implemented, be they written or unwritten. Uh, at the same time, I believe that even uh, during the process of, uh, uh, even before the, those uh, systems of oppression are dismantled, before the apartheid falls, I believe that this is very much uh, useful and it, it is a, a legislation like that will pay off greatly in the long run, uh, regardless of the developments of, um, of the situation. Do you believe the Israeli prime minister would be able to withstand international pressure to veto this, if he wants to veto this legislation? Uh, I think he, that, go ahead. I think that it would depend on um, on the specifics of the, on the specifics on the grounds of legislation, both of the, uh, of the members of uh, parliament, uh, but I think that there is a good chance that this legislation would be ex uh, accepted by uh, by everybody involved. All right. Okay, let's go to the next legislation, and that's common police force. And again, that's a legislation that Andre wanted to discuss, um, giving him the opportunity to look at other um, uh, legislation. Common police force. Uh, uh, Libby, would you be so kind as to read this legislation? Equal number of Israeli and Palestinians at each level. Distinct uniforms for the common police force different from the Israeli or Palestinian police force. Independent of the Israeli and Palestinian security forces. In cooperation with the separate Israeli and Palestinian authorities. Address sensitive religious, cultural, and language requirements giving each side exclusive management of the holy site, but giving the common police force the right to enforce entry and exit routes to the holy sites. Facilitate the operation of the joint economic zones. Investigate corruption by administrators who refuse to teach tolerance. Investigate allegations of intolerance and racist hate crime against Israelis and Palestinians. Assist in managing checkpoints. Guard the parliament building and threats against members of the Confederation. Facilitate access to and safety of religious facilities. We hereby submit this legislation to the Israeli government and the Palestinian. We bestow upon them a veto power which may be exercised in the next 60 days. All right, put your questions in the chat, please. And then Nasir, if you have any questions, uh, just um, uh, relay them to us. Um, let's go to the Palestinian parliament members. Please vote on this legislation. Do you support an Israeli-Palestinian Confederation police force to protect both people? Publish the vote. 93% of the Palestinian parliament members voted in favor of this legislation. Let's go to the Israeli parliament members. Please vote on this legislation. Israeli parliament members, please vote. Uh, please publish the votes. Uh, 93% of the Israeli, remember, we need 55%. We are reaching 80, 90% on, from the Israeli and the Palestinian parliament members. Uh, Nasir, are there any questions regarding this legislation? Yes. 
Um, well, there's two hands raised. George is raising his hand. He didn't ask it in chat. And then there's another question about from uh, Ola about the uh, checkpoints. She says, well, she maybe it's just a comment. Forget it. It's not a question. Go ahead. Okay, this is George. Go ahead, George. Uh, I missed one or two meetings. Was this police legislation discussed at that time? Uh, no, we have different legislation at different uh, simulations. It depends on what the guest wants to speak about. Okay, because we, we, you know, these are really complex issues. I mean, we have a good idea to send out this legislation by email a few days before, so people can study it and uh, you know arrive at some sort of okay, informed but... opinion on this stuff. Just he hearing so is it, it a verbally, question or a comment. It's well, it's a question. It's an important question. Okay, because uh, we just, we're gonna we're, we're gonna have we're gonna have a general discussion afterwards. We just want to move through the questions. All right, uh, let's go to the um, president of Palestine, uh, Saeed. Are you going to veto this legislation? No, but uh, the only problem I have by saying that uh, managing checkpoints, I believe, when we are reaching this level of um, in government, we should not be having checkpoints between us. Well, I totally agree. Uh, let's go to the uh, Mr. Prime Minister. Are you still in trouble with your uh, coalition? On this subject, I would say that I am going to veto uh, this legislation unless unless there is some uh, um, additional provisions that give um, my government the ability to check the backgrounds of every single member of the police joint police force to make sure that there are no terrorists infiltrating it so that we Israelis can feel confident that this police force will not be hostile to uh, Israel. Well, it says here in cooperation with the separate Israeli and Palestinian authorities. So that implies that uh, we would uh, uh, be willing to work with the Palestinian and the Israeli because they have their own concern too. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, uh, they don't want Israeli uh, uh, terrorists to uh, participate in this government as well. So we will cooperate with the, your government and the Palestinian government in order to facilitate uh, a police force that uh, has uh, a true uh, uh, police enforcement intentions and not uh, to be infiltrated by terrorists on both sides. Okay, yeah, in that case, I will not veto it. All right, then let's go to the uh, uh, to our uh, guest today, Andre. Uh, you saw how this uh, political uh, uh, process works. Uh, any comments? Uh, on the common police force, and this the re the reason I picked this because this is very um, this is a very relevant question to me personally, a person who works in the West Bank with. Uh, specifically protective presence, and I face uh, authorities on a regular basis. Just four days ago, I spent 11 hours uh, uh, in uh, under in illegal detention by first the Israeli army and then the Israeli police. Uh, I've All of my friends have been beaten, arrested, uh, harassed, and there is there are regular invasions of uh, Palestinian villages by the Israeli army and the Israeli police. And I've seen, I've seen the destruction uh, created by um, by Israeli raids on the refugee camps in Turkara, in Janine, Nablus, and so on. Um, uh, so I think that this is actually one of the main steps that we can make in order to make the situation better would be to create an alternative authority, uh, even if it's alongside the existing one. Here, it's um, I believe that an alternative authority would help regardless of the of the actual uh, of the actual situation, uh, if it's UN peacekeeper is great, if it's uh, a common police force is great, whatever else, whatever else that doesn't directly answer to the Israeli apartheid state would help, uh, and it has the authority to uh, first use violence in order to defend themselves uh, and to, to defend the the, the area uh, which uh, which they are interested with. Um, given the amounts of uh, attacks by Israeli settlers and Israeli police and Israeli army, uh, hopefully this won't uh, escalate into into the Wild West even more than than it already does. But I believe that that would help if there are people with authority. Currently, it's done by civilians, by uh, human rights at activists uh, coming from um, 
uh, from uh, the West and uh, Israeli citizens and Palestinian human rights uh, activists. Mm. So I, I believe that this would be very useful. I have concerns as to whether the Israeli side would agree to it, specifically in uh, Area C, because in Area C, there would be in the West Bank, there would be uh, a big question as to, like the, the Palestinian Authority wouldn't, uh, probably wouldn't um, veto this because it already has no, no ability to impact what's happening in Area C at all. But uh, it's now under direct Israeli occupation and currently it is the only authority in Area C of the West Bank. So I would, there would be a question from me as to what would be the reason for the Israeli authority to give up its control uh, and to allow any kind of uh, any kind of alternative um, uh, police force or whatever of whatever else, uh, given that it would just supersede, it, it would have to give up authority for that. Um, so, but, if yeah. the prime minister of Israel says, "Well, I'm going to veto it uh, only with regard to Area C," would that make it more? Realistic? Um, I'm not sure. I, I mean, it would probably make it more realistic, yes. Can I can okay. I ask a question regarding this legislation? Because Andre, Andre, I think, is in a very good position to answer it. Because he has probably the most experience with the situation in regards to like the checkpoints and things like this. Andre, one of the things that concerns me about this is about um, that we're acknowledging that there's checkpoints and that they need to be managed. And it could be argued that this is because this is the here and now, what we need to deal with now. But some Palestinians like myself feel that this is just a way to buy time to continue the existing checkpoints and the existing occupation that we have now. Do you feel that this, this is something like luring us into an extension of the occupation and the current problem that we have now, rather than working toward a future solution? This is more of like a general concern that uh, I have with, um, with, the, with any system that doesn't explicitly uh, repudiate the Israeli apartheid that is existent like, on, on the entire territory between the river and the sea. Um, I, I, however, in this specific case, I think that even if we have a, like, even if the checkpoints remain the way that they are now, even if we just, like, get a police force which has some authority to defend the Palestinian villages in Area C, like, that would be helpful on its own. Because currently we're in a state of not just an apartheid, but a rapidly accelerating ethnic cleansing of the West Bank. And anything that can slow it down, uh, I think, is useful uh whether it would uh, whether it would prolong the the occupation hopefully not this is a completely valid concern uh, but at the same time i think that any tools that uh, can be used in order to stop slash slow down the ethnic cleansing of the west bank uh, i think are a good idea all right thank you let's go to the next legis legislation and that's uh compensation to palestinian refugees I'll just read it. Our original refugees are offered two options. Option one, return. This is about to the original refugees, meaning 1960, 1947, 48, and 1967. They are, we are the federal government. We are offering the following, that the original refugees will be offered two options. Option one, is the right of return to Israel, Palestine, and two hundred and fifty thousand dollar compensation for their suffering. Option two is to accept compensation of five hundred thousand and waive the right of return to Israel, but not to Palestine. In other words, they can still return to Palestine if there is two. Uh, state solution agreed upon either by the parliament, the federal government, or by the government of Israel and Palestine. Those governments, the government of Israel and Palestine, are given a veto power. Um, <clears throat> Nasir, are there any questions regarding this legislation? 
No one has posed any questions, but I would pose the question is why is this so direct against Palestinians in the diaspora? Why would it not be the same for like I, I, I agree. I was gonna say the same thing. Yeah, uh, so, so so you're asking Palestinians to waive their right of return, but you're not asking for Jews. I think it's very one sided and I think it's in fact it's it's very insulting. Biased, biased. Say that again. It's, it's, it's extremely biased uh, offer because you are offering to the Palestinians, not to the Israel, to the Jewish, because Jewish claim that they can come to the land. So you are telling me uh, anybody can come from Russia and claim the citizenship of the Jewish state, but as a Palestinian, I have to waive it. So you have to offer both or cancel both. Well, the, the, Jews, well. the Jews are giving the right to um, yeah, but. But you're limiting Israel, the Palestinian under, authority under under uh, the right of uh, uh, what they call right of return. The Jewish government allows them the right uh, to immigrate to Israel if they are if they are Jews. Yeah, but this legislation is going to basically say to the Palestinian Authority government or the future Palestinian government that because these people accepted money, they are waiving their right of return. Therefore, you cannot set your immigration policy or your uh, migration policy for the, the giving the right of return for your people. And, and so not, takes, okay. uh, I, I, understand, just, I understand just, what you're saying, that they are accepting money and... and, and no, no, and no. And, and one, one other thing, uh, Joseph, offering the money is completely insulting because Palestinians have been living as refugees and been offered so many things and rejected it. So this as it is, it's, it's kind of like... Uh, all right. Uh, so it's what, what, based on okay. bribery, which is a criminal offense. We okay, cannot what, what, offer okay. crime. All right. What are you offering? This, this is criminal. What? I'm sorry. Okay, just, but just but but I should say, Saeed, there is. Bribery. If you look at the fourth what, point. What are you? What what? Okay, you are against this legislation. But what are you offering the re the Palestinian refugees? I, I will I will I will leave the refugees uh, part for the refugees to decide what they want to do. Because if there is people wants to come back to Yaffa or to Akka or to Tantura, this is their right. I am. I do have my own town. For example, we have a brother, uh, Andre. He came from Russia. He's free to move between Israel and Palestine. I'm a Palestinian who born, born there. I have restriction even to enter from a city to a city. So my point is give the Palestinians their right to choose for this, because I cannot speak in their behalf, or anybody, any Palestinian or Israeli government can speak in their behalf. Okay. We are the government of Israel Palestine. Okay. We are not the government of the Palestinian or the Jewish people globally. Okay. The question is what does, what do we do as a federal government? with regard to the Palestinian refugees or the Jews or whatever you want. You need to come up with a with a legislation rather than saying this legislation is not good enough. What are you what are your suggestions? And are you asking me or asking somebody else? Everyone, I'm asking everyone. I think I, there's one that was presented. Uh, and I think it says uh, to broaden option one into re repatriation of property ownership or compensation of 250. But setting it on a waiver of right of return is what I find problematic. So if I, for example, I'm a Palestinian and I've established my life for the last 80 years, there may be a chance I may not well, want to go back no, to Jaffa. But they have two options. Option one return and 250,000 compensation. Sorry, if I, if I may add something. The, in general, by international law, the, um, the refugees have the like an inalienable right to return, uh, but international law also accommodates that the, uh, the refugees must be able to choose between uh, returning and uh, waiving their right to return and receiving compensation. It's still completely in the hands of the refugees. Yeah. And that's what the UN would try to pressure the Israeli state uh, in 1948 yeah. after the ethnic cleansing of uh, 700,000 Palestinians from their land. Uh, the UN was trying to pressure them to either let people uh, return uh, or accept uh, compensation. And uh, the Israeli state 
rejected it. And it has rejected any attempts to um, to establish a right of return for Palestinians since. Okay. Uh, let's have but, the... you know, My point was that like, the choice between compensation, uh, between returning or re uh, waiving the rights and compensation, that, that is essentially what the international law said. All right. Let's, we need to move forward. Palestinian, please vote on this. Palestinian parliament members, please vote on this legislation. We need 55% of the Palestinian parliament members to vote on this legislation. As the president, I recommend a yes vote because otherwise the Palestinian refugees will, they haven't been uh, uh, compensated up until now, haven't been given a, a right of return. And I'm not sure what the Israeli and the Palestinian governments will do. All right. Uh, publish the vote. 56% of the Palestinian parliament <laughs> members voted in favor of this legislation. So it's. It passed the Palestinian uh, parliament uh, members. Let's go to the Israeli parliament members. Israeli parliament members, please vote. Publish the vote. 70% of the Israeli parliament members voted in favor of this legislation. Uh, let's go to the uh, president of uh, Palestine. Mr. President, are you going to veto this legislation? No, I'm not. Let's go to the Prime Minister of Israel. Are you going to veto this legislation? Well, um, as a very conservative right-wing uh, Prime Minister, I have a lot of issues with this, and let alone the compensation, even just the mention of a two-state solution. Um, I uh, The only reason I am hesitating is because of the fragility of my coalition. In, 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 I have internal problems. Uh, therefore, I would... Um, I guess I will not veto it, as long as I know that uh, I, I get enough support within Israel to stay as a prime minister within the Knesset. All right, thank you. Um, uh, let's go to the uh, next legislation, and that would be the next, last legislation for today, Rebuilding Gaza and Southern Israel. Libby, would you be so kind as to um, read this legislation? Rebuilding Gaza and Southern Israel. The IPC is the only uh, Libby, Libby, uh, just let me stop you. Nasir, can you take over for a few seconds? I need sure. to take a break. Sure, sure. Go ahead. Go ahead, Libby. All right. The IPC is the only legitimate government in Israel and Palestine, consisting of 300 parliament members elected by the entire population. Approximately 125 members represent the destroyed areas. The IPC is committed to the well-being of all people including the 5 million individuals directly affected by the violence since October 7th. The IPC believes that the future of the Gaza and Israeli people is interconnected. It is unlikely that the Israeli and Palestinian governments will be able to restore a normal, peaceful existence in the foreseeable future. The IPC is requesting a $50 billion grant from the international community, which includes Israel and Palestine, to fund and coordinate the rebuilding of the devastated areas. The IPC will prioritize the following. One, the IPC is calling for an immediate ceasefire and the immediate return of all political prisoners in Israel and Palestine to their homes. Two, rebuilding thousands of homes, roads, hospitals, civic buildings, and infrastructure to facilitate the immediate return of all people to their homes. And three, restoring law and order and civil society that have been destroyed. 
the government of Israel and Palestine are given a veto power. The government of Israel. And okay, there's uh, if there's no questions, um, uh, Andre, would you like to comment on this before we vote? Um. I think it is important to uh, also w w in in the context of uh, rebuilding Gaza, it, it is important to uh, contextualize that within the destruction uh, and the genocide which has been um, perpetrated by uh, by the Israeli state for the past year, and to I mean place responsibility on it, um, and to like I, I see that this. Uh, this legislation is asking for a $50 billion grant from the international community. Uh, I believe that there needs to be uh, significant pressure or applied by, I don't know, by IPC, by, by the international community, by anything, uh, that the Israeli government needs to pay for as, 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 as much uh, reparations as possible. And I believe that um, uh, in general, given the history of, uh, of the of the destruction uh, in the West Bank and in Gaza and in 48 by, by the Israeli state. I believe that at this point, the Israeli state owes a ridiculous amount of money in reparations. And I think that it, when we reach the, the question of rebuilding and um, uh, creating um, a, a, a new, new reality for, um, for, for this land, it is uh, essential to, to acknowledge the fact that the, there has been a perpetrator to the destruction. Uh, which has been in this land for the past 70 years. Okay. And right, we... um, Oh, go ahead. Uh, We're going to have a vote. Oh, I was going to okay. say. Go ahead. Go uh, ahead. I'm sorry. Just take into consideration that there is a possibility that Israel wants to expel the Palestinians from Gaza. And um, yeah. uh, is that right, uh, Mr. Prime Minister of Israel? Or do you intend to expel the Palestinians from Gaza? Indeed, that's an option. I'd be very happy to have the international community build a lot of houses there, but, and then I'll put my settlers there. Uh, well, that's a different story. All right, let's go to, go ahead, uh, uh, Nasir, vote. go ahead, continue. So uh, if we could have the votes from the Palestinian members, uh, Dan, can you put up the vote? And if you want to publish the results. Okay, 92%. And now can we have the vote for the for the Israeli? Same vote, but for the Israeli members. X if you're not Israeli. And go ahead and post the results when you're ready. 100% of the Israeli members voted yes. Um, do you want to, Joseph, you want me to continue or you want to go on? Uh, well, are there any questions by the audience? Okay. Can on, I on a, a comment? Okay. Comment? Can I comment? Yeah. Can, can we just see if they're going to be vetoed or not? Or you want to, or you want to? Oh, I beg your pardon. Yeah, I beg your pardon. Yeah, yeah, so so Pal it. Palestinian president, do you veto this legislation? Said. What is the question again? I'm sorry. Do you veto this legislation as Palestinian <laughs> president? No, I don't. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister of Israel, would you will, will do you veto this legislation? Yes, I do. Okay, I will. You... The only way I could accept it is if we remove point three, that where the IPC will not have any role at all in restoring law and order, civil society, and and anything like that. We want to have complete control. We would uh, envisage a, a, a role for the IPC in uh, reconstruction, but not anything more than that. Um, Are you talking about in Israel or in the Palestinian areas? This is uh, in Gaza. So, you, so you're you're saying you you want to have a role in restoring law and order in in Palestine in Gaza? Yes, we want okay. to keep okay. full control of the of the of those territories. Okay. All right, uh, so you are going to veto legislation that is going to grant substantial amount of money to your people, which have been uh, relocated from southern Israel uh, because you want to control Gaza. 
Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. I am very right wing, so this is my position. Okay. Uh, do you realize that you're going to have um, your coalition possibly uh, dismembered and also in the next election, you may not be elected because the IPC is going to put pressure on you and on the people of Israel to elect someone else. If that happens, I might change my mind because I'm always attached to power. But for the moment, I am going to veto this. Yeah, but uh, we are going to point out that you have allowed a year of uh, suffering for the people of Palestine and Israel because of your political, uh, personal reasons. And uh, we're going to point out that you're not trustworthy for the people of Israel and Palestine, that in fact, you've been totally um, uh, obstructive to the process of peace. And we're not gonna, even if you change your mind, we're just gonna point out that you are not a trustworthy uh, prime minister. That is a risk that I need to take. So is there any changes that we can make at this time in order to benefit the people of Israel and Palestine. Uh, can I come in, please, Joseph? In this uh, legislation. Can I come in? Can I ask you about the the thing about this, uh, hang on, as affected by the violence since October the 7th. Why does it have to be October? Why can't it be 1948? I get very disturbed by that. October 7th is almost a... Uh, why don't we put 1948? Well, the, uh, such a, these, this is the kind of proposal okay. that puts me okay. off. As I mean, I hear people. Yeah, but this is uh, this is not a proposal. Asking. So no, um, no I, I can. The only reason I would lift the, the my veto would be if we uh, remove any language in this that talks about IPC playing a role in restoring uh, civil society and law and order in Gaza. Well, it doesn't say anything about who will be restoring it. It says restoring law and order and civil society. Are you against law and order and civil society? No, as long as it is under our full control. It doesn't It doesn't give you um, exclusive control. It doesn't give us exclusive control. Well. It just it, says uh, that it will, we will restore this legislation is in favor of restoring law and order and civil society that have been destroyed. Are you against law and order and civil society? No, as long as we are in control. And if you tell me that that's the spirit of this um, legislation, then I would lift my veto. Okay, we're not telling you anything about your exclusive jurisdiction. We are, but you are removing this veto, correct? <laughs> Yes, that's the way we interpret it. So, all right, okay, good. Thank you. Let's go to uh, Andre. Andre, what are your thoughts uh, uh, seeing the the political uh, um, situation being unfolding in in front of your eyes? What are your thoughts? Um, I have two main thoughts. One, I think that in reality, this is a kind of uh, this is the kind of legislation which would be. Uh, easier to pass than other ones, given that all that it's the main thing that it's proposing is giving a grant, so get, getting a lot of money out of other countries in order to do stuff in Gaza, which would be which would probably be acceptable to both uh, the Palestinian side and the Israeli side as long as there are no other considerations. Yeah, yes, please do give us uh, fifty million, uh, fifty billion dollars uh, to to rebuild stuff. Um, um, another another thought that I had is that the this process by which uh, the Israeli prime prime minister would be able to uh, eliminate provisions um, within uh, within legislation uh, could be the the downfall of the project because it's uh, it, it would essentially have the authority to uh, limit any ac actual meaningful change. For instance, the previous legislation, the right to return, I think that would be impossible to pass even under, like, e even though it's insufficient, I believe that it is uh, 
it is entirely insufficient that it gives the right to return only to the original refugees and not their descendants. I believe that in order for any actual peace building process and to, to reach a, any actual justice in this land, there needs to be complete and full right of return for all the Palestinian refugees and their descendants. But even with these provisions, I do not see an Israeli government, even the most liberal slash leftist one, uh, that would agree to this, because this, this is something that the Israeli government has been blocking since its inception, uh, despite all the international pressure, despite all the, even the quote unquote leftist governments uh, of uh, Mapai and uh, uh, whatever, Levi Eshkol, uh, Ben Gurion, uh, Golda Meir, uh, it's, it's, it's been impossible to get any kind of progress on the right to return to Palestinian refugees. So, Mike, I, th I think that here in this process, we, we in the process of negotiation, negotiation for this specific uh, legislation, we kind of got to see a glimpse of uh, of the thing that I would have a fear about. Uh, on the other hand, it's uh, you, you know, you know, it, this specific legislation, I think it, it would be uh, would be possible. To... All right, I I just want to emphasize that. And I don't think that it's being emphasized enough that what we are proposing is a completely different reality in Israel-Palestine. Not the reality of Israel against the Palestinians, but an additional political powerhouse, which is Palestinians and Israelis together. And when you analyze any situation, any legislation, you need to take into consideration the assumptions that a new political reality has been created. And that, that would be, the new political reality would make it very difficult for the Palestinian or the Israeli government to re revert back to the old reality. This is a new reality. And and I know it's very hard to accept. It's done, in, you know, on, online by Zoom. But if you ex if you accept the new reality, then you, I think that you will see a different results. Uh, Nasir, do, I saw your hand being raised. Do you have questions? <clears throat> yeah, my question was that. I kind of see what Andre is saying about the bill being uh, paid by international community, but we are now seeing countries like UAE, who were uh, big, uh, who were who were who were basically paying the price for these Israeli attacks and demolition of Gaza, and now they're saying, "Why are you expecting us to pay for the damages that you seem to be doing every four to five years?" And there has to be some international uh, nations and stuff. There, there, they, they need to be, understand that. They're not going to be saying, okay, we're going to keep paying the bill because Israel every once in a while feels like they need to go in and destroy these places. Yeah, you're speaking well, about the existing reality. You are you are ignoring the reality, the artificial reality. I agree, it's an artificial reality that is being in is that we are asking you to work under in these assumptions. Under these artificial reality, I am the president. I will go to every country around the world. I will contact every company around the world and ask them to donate. And if they do not donate, they will risk their exposure. So, it, because we have a new reality. All right. Uh, I think that- uh, Can I just say one word? Vote. Can I get a word in? Oh yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Olivia. I, I missed you. I apologize. Quite, Go ahead. Quite okay. I'll try to be short. This piece of legislation that we often discuss makes me feel rather ill at ease because the destruction of Gaza is something. Uh, the recent destruction is unlike the others in that it's phenomenal. It is just beyond words. It's it's. Norman Fingerstein said in an interview a few days ago, "Gaza's gone. It's finished. It's over." So I think so. Any reconstruction, I think, would be for the distant future. Well, I hope not too distant. Because apparently the rubble is, it's between 45 and 50 million tons. It's all phenomenal. Any words we use are, are very are superlative to describe the destruction of everything. 
cancellation of a past and the present and future of these you know, terribly, terribly unfortunate Gazans. So it would be something in the very distant future, I feel. And also at present, the Israeli government, they're in daft. I mean, my God, they're going to settle. They're talking about settling the north. That's why they're now telling people that have moved, you know, God knows how many times, to sort of get out of the north, a certain part of the north, because they're going to, they think they're going to settle. They're put settlers there, as they think they're going to do in the south of Lebanon. They are now bringing real estate people with uh, customers on boat trips, looking at the land in North Gaza. The whole thing is so is so over the top, you know, I mean, words fail me. But I do think if re reconstruction is going to happen, and we hope it'll be someday, I fear it'll be in the dis in the future. Now, if there are any engineers uh, amidst our participants, they would certainly, you know, uh, offer more useful comments than, than, than myself. But reading what I've read, well, you know, Olivia, we need to move on. That's all. That, yeah, let's move on. Okay. But right. I do feel it is discussing this. Okay. okay? Let's, let's let's have a uh, a, a sure. post simulation survey. After participating in the simulation, do you support a common federal government? Please vote. Okay, publish the vote. Uh, Ninety-five percent voted yes. One person, one person voted no. Uh, could that person uh, please identify yourself? The person who voted no. Do I have to? No. Uh, yeah, I voted no because. In are you are you Israeli or Palestinian yeah, parliament it. member? I'm I'm Palestinian member and I um, consider you, myself. You voted. You you are in this simulation. Yeah. I know you are going to be our next guest. But yes, I am in the simulation. I was a Palestinian. Okay. What area do you represent? Uh, Rafa. And do you, do you accept the constitution? I did accept the constitution, uh, but I had issues with other elements in the. Um, in, in what we look at, some of the legislation we we shared. Okay, but you accepted the constitution. Yeah. But so the, why are you but the post, against but, the federal government if you accepted the constitution? I don't understand that. But the post simulation survey is not him voting as a member of parliament. It's him voting to, because the question was before. Yeah, that's true. That's yeah. true. So that's so he's true. voting as a Palestinian and nothing to do with the Confederation. Just does he think okay. that yeah. Yeah. You're, you're absolutely right. OK. Yeah. All right. But 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 OK, go ahead. Uh, these are okay. go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'm just saying that um, uh, the issues of uh, secular government, issues of education uh, uh, on uh, tolerance, what are like these would be things that my 47,000 constituents uh, would feel very strongly about as an imposition of a culture and a value that they disagree with, that they need to protect themselves from. Um, not different from how some people in the U.S. and states feel that the government, the federal government, is uh, um, is overreaching. So that's that's how I saw that perspective. Okay, so you are against the federal government because not entirely the federal government, but these elements. Like, so I wouldn't accept those laws. Um, and the imposition of, of uh, certain values in the federal government. I would want the federal government to have less, uh, uh, be a bit more general and not so specific on tolerance and education. And uh, uh, because I would see that as a, a dominant narrative imposing on me who is tolerant and who's not tolerant. One man's terrorist is another man's uh, freedom fighter. So that issue, uh, my 47,000 constituents would want me to vote against. Okay, so what part of the constitution would you change? Uh, can you show, uh, show it again? I believe if his time is coming, Joseph, we should just wait for... Uh, for yeah, okay, we'll wait until... Me. Okay, we'll wait until you are our guest. Sure. You're right. Okay, so uh, closing remark, a common democratic gov confederation government can bring peace. We can do the online election. It's very feasible. Um, I just learned uh, a month ago that 
the astronaut was able to vote from space. Uh, so if uh, astronauts can vote from space, then Palestinians and Israelis can vote securely in Israel-Palestine. Um, the cost of creating the platform and, and explaining the benefit is uh, about $100 million in our estimate. The Israelis and the Palestinians are spending over $3 billion every week to prolong the work, the, 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 to prolong the war. Uh, and the current Israeli and the Palestinian governments are not legitimate because they are not elected by the people of Israel and Palestine. We could create a democracy for the people of Israel and Palestine that could bring peace with a fraction of the cost. These assumptions, in my opinion, are very realistic. They are achievable, and we should work to make them a reality. This is what it costs uh, to buy with $100 million. Instead of this, we can also make peace for the people of Israel and Palestine. So now I'm going to open to a, a open discussion. I'm going to stop sharing, and um, you can... Um, and and uh, you can ask Andre any question you want. Uh, let's start with uh, Nasir. You have your hand raised, uh, or I don't know if it's from before. Or let's go to George. As anyway, I can just have a second. I I want to thank uh, Andrew. I want to withdraw from this because I have a family. Uh, I have a, another arrangement. Uh, so uh, thank you, Andrew, for for showing up, and thank you, everyone. I appreciate you. All right. Thank you, Singh. Uh, George, go ahead. Yes, Ashley. Joseph, thank you. As I was saying before, I have no Do you make up this legislation? Where does this legislation come from? These legislations are pass part of a process to uh, figure out what, how could a federal government pass legislation that would thread the needle, meaning how it would be impossible for the Israeli and the Palestinian governments to veto. I understand that, Joseph. Who writes this legislation? Who wrote it? Is it you? Yes. Yeah, but Joseph, to make this simulation much more realistic, the way most parliaments work is that govern, you know, legislation emerges out of committees or from members, you know. We have 40 or 50 heads here. 40 heads are better than one. Yeah, but we've I've written legislation and I've proposed it. So anybody okay, who wants to write well, legislation I, can propose excellent, it. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. So do we understand that, for example, you know, you're reading this legislation. That's the first time I heard it. You know, that it's a complex piece of legislation or fairly complex. Or, you know, just by hearing it, I really have difficulty. Is this worth anything? Can it be improved? There ought to be a pro. So what I'm suggesting, you know, I'm trying to be constructive, is first of all, legislation should not not originate in one head. Two, before these weekly meetings, the upcoming legislation at the next meeting should be sent out to people so they can submit criticisms and improvements, and this would improve the process and make it much more realistic. It's a win-win all around it's a win-win for the ipc project and it's a uh, it also makes it more interesting for participants and it'll i believe it'll bring them back much more but you know that i'm very uncomfortable with the way uh, things are going in this regard the only real activity here is passing legislation and the way we're doing it um i think is very unrealistic and it's it's it's, you know, I, I, it's not good. Well, you could say the same thing about potted cheese and, and what is unrealistic about the legislation that is being proposed. I agree with you that it's not written in a statutory way, the way the uh, a real parliament would write. I, I totally agree with you. I agree with you that there is it doesn't go through a committee, but that's not the purpose. The purpose is to show how a federal government could pass legislation 
that neither side would be able to veto. That's the Joseph, purpose. at the very least, at the very least, send out this stuff so we can look at it. Because I can't, I can't in, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really going to drop out of this because, uh, you know, if this keeps going this way, you know, you got to send this out. Uh, these votes are. Uh, uh, may, may I interject? Uh, I, I think the issue is not, rather than focusing on the details of, it, uh, of any hypothetical legislation, the exercise here is on the process. It make an analog analogy with the EU. When the EU was first formed in 1957, the laws that it passed were not high brow legislation. It was boring stuff like uh, establishing a common customs form so, so that all truck drivers could fill it in in an in, a, in an easy way across languages. Or they made a, a, a common way of uh, weighing gasoline for the point of, from the point in order to to calculate tax. I mean, it's extremely okay. detailed in technical legislation. That legislation over time created established trust among previously warring countries, France and Germany, to the point where they they have now formed a, 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 an actual union um, among all these countries. And the idea here is to build trust through even very small and stupid <laughs> measures, but where people can say, well, Palestinians feel, oh, well, we can do business with some, some Israelis and some Israelis will be, Israelis will be feeling that they can do the same with, with Palestinians. It's a question of building trust, even in very simple things. The, the example- Giacomo, I agree hundred percent. You know, we don't have to debate this point. All, right. All I'm saying is it would be cost-free, very easy to send out this legislation for a comment and maybe Joseph could Im improve it based on the comments. That's all I'm saying. All right, thank you. Um, I Nasir? think that, yeah, I think also for simulation purposes, sometimes we just have to have a lot of imagination and uh, mm. that things happened and stuff because the idea here is what would happen in case of a simulation. If we were actually running the day-to-day -day business and maybe it would be different. Um, I wanted to acknowledge uh, our guest, Andre. Andre is doing something that's very important and I really admire him for this. He's giving a lot of, he's on Instagram. If you guys recommend follow him on Instagram, Twitter. He He's basically giving uh, us a realistic picture of the quiet war. The quiet war that's going on in the West Bank. We hear about the bombings of Gaza. We hear about the bombings of Lebanon. But, you know, the, the quiet war that's going on with what the settler movement is doing to the Palestinian communities, people from like me from East Jerusalem and like my brother, uh, Sa my uh, Palestinian brother, Said, he's from uh, Mozara Shakri Sh Sharkia in the West Bank, a town that has been attacked by settlers violently. Houses were burned. Cars were burned. Um, so, I, you know, I, I appreciate what you do, Andre, a lot and exposing this, what's going on in the West Bank, the quiet mm. war, which is not necessarily that quiet, but it's a... You know, more than a thousand Palestinians have been killed. Nine thousand have been arrested. Uh, lands have been confiscated. Uh, ancient sites and stuff. So I uh, thank you for that a lot. I was wondering if you could touch base more about the general attitude because a lot of the the movements that I've been worked with uh, prior to October seventh. To tell you the truth, many of them have actually been shattered because of October seventh because of the attitudes that that. Uh, even in the peace camps of Israel, we have people who are disillusioned with uh, any type of coexistence movements. And we also have Palestinians who feel that there's just no hope to talk with Israelis because it's uh, it's it's just it's pretty bleak. So do you do you see a positive for the future for these kind of movements and these kind of efforts? My general my general take on coexistence movements is that I'm not I'm not against coexistence movements. <laughs> Useful in order to build an understanding between people and to promote, uh, promote equality, promote uh, you know human connection is very important. But I think that this is a very long term thing. I think currently the problem is not the lack of coexistence. The problem is not that we're trying to achieve peace and we cannot find it. The problem is that we are trying to achieve justice because justice because peace without justice just won't be enough here. Because uh, we have, e even if we click our fingers and suddenly all the Israelis and Pal Palestinians are very, very much down to coexist and they want to make friends with each other and live in the same land, this is not going to solve the problem because the problem is not mutual hatred. The problem is the system of apartheid and the continued uh, 
attack uh, and expulsions on the Palestinians by the Israeli state, which has for for decades now controlled the entire uh, piece of land between between the river and the sea. Um, in terms of the coexistence movement, some fell apart. There are some that actually blew up uh, thanks to October 7th, for instance, and Dean Biafad standing together uh, saw a great rise in, in the in the recent months because of uh, because of now this big uh, coexistence movement. The the stuff in the West Bank, the the organization that worked there, some of them are not concerned with uh, with, with any of this. They're just concerned with human rights, and they're concerned with the attacks on the Palestinians that are that are rampant, that are constant there, um, and um, uh, and essentially, uh, but, but also there are organizations that are anti-Zionist, uh, and I consider myself an anti-Zionist, and they, they're focused not so much on a building coexistence or cooperation because they're focused on what we believe to be the biggest problem currently, which is the system of oppression, apartheid, and destruction, which has been instituted by the Israeli state and which has been in place since 1947. Andre, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, about your history, and uh, where were you born? When did you move to Israel, Palestine, and when did you become an activist, and what made you become an activist? I uh, I grew up in Russia. Uh, I I was born there. I, I'm Russian. I lived in a in several countries. I, I lived in, uh, in the UK for a while. I lived in China for a while, um, uh, and then at some point I came back to Russia. But then Russia invaded Ukraine, and me as a political journalist and as a person. It, it, it has been affiliated with uh, uh, opposition magazines, a lot of uh, a lot of which are now uh, considered foreign agents or uh, extremist organizations by by the Kremlin. Uh, it's it, it, I, I am not I do not feel safe coming back uh, coming back to Russia. So I I ran away to the to the easiest uh, place I could run away to. I got an Israeli passport. Uh, and at that point, I because it was so chaotic, I, like I, I was essentially just the a privileged, a very privileged refugee. Um, I I didn't have time to, to to figure everything out. I had I started learning more on the app, so I I moved. And at that point, when I just moved, I knew little. I was I did not have a very, very good understanding or a strong opinion of anything that's happening here. But then the more, the, the longer I lived here, the more I spoke to people, the more I saw, the more I realized that uh, if I am to be in this land, I need to do something about it. Uh, and I started getting more and more involved with activism, uh, which led me to discover more and more of the, uh, of the horror that, that's, uh, that is committed on a daily basis uh, in this land. So I started uh, started doing different stuff, uh, activism in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, but also going to to the West Bank to provide protective presence to Palestinian villages that are under attack by settlers and by the occupation forces. Um, and a few months ago, I uh, started doing uh, started essentially moving that to social media because the, the West Bank is underrepresented uh, on the world stage in terms of media. All the attention is justifiably on Gaza at the moment, now also in Lebanon. Uh, and uh, I think it was, uh, it, it, I thought that it wasn't, it, it could be impactful to bring more attention to the West Bank because oftentimes attention actually helps deter uh, both settlers and the occupation forces. And there have been many examples of when, for instance, the army sets up a random checkpoint in the middle of a Palestinian village uh, just for the purposes of intimidation. And we arrive on the scene, we start filming them, we start asking them, what are they doing there? And then five minutes later, they're gone. Because their goal is harassment, but they do not want that to be uh, taken out into into the wider public. Um, and when they when they don't care, and often they don't care, often there will be attacks. Often there will be, as I said a few days ago, myself I, I was beaten, and my fellow journalists were uh, taken, uh, blindfolded, held at a military base, uh, and, and then uh, t t arrested. And there were like cases created, and it was for completely for nothing. We, we were just stopped at a checkpoint. 
Um, and so sometimes, and as time goes on, it, it happens more and more, uh, they become more aggressive and they start caring less about, about the exposure, but it's still useful to, to bring more attention in order to get more pressure from the international community and in order to make any kind of progress in uh, uh, slowing down the, the process of ethnic cleansing of the West Bank and working towards an end to the uh, Israeli apartheid system that it forces. How are you being received by the general public in Israel and the Palestinian general public? Uh, well, from Israelis, I'm getting daily death threats and threats to find my family, to uh, break my kneecaps with hammers, to uh, cut my throat and so on. Uh, at the same time, I have uh, a lot of support from, uh, from the leftists, from uh, anti-Zionists, and even some like less leftists and more liberal people, they, they are like maybe they don't like me, but they a lot of them respect what I do um, in terms of the work and bringing more attention to the crimes of, uh, of the occupation and of the settler movement. Um, by the Palestinian public, I haven't had any any negative receptions so far. I don't think the, the, there are a lot of people uh, welcome. People are very welcoming to me in. Uh, Many places that I go to, and I've been all across all across the West Bank. Um, I'm getting a lot of support from people. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if, there will be people who like me. There will be people who hate me for for many different reasons. Uh, but generally, the, the Israelis really don't really don't like me on average. It says there that um, you are lending support to the Palestinians by part participating and it sounds like you're almost like protecting the Palestinians uh, from the Israelis. How, how do you do that? Uh, I mean, Michael, I, I don't know about protection specifically. It's uh, rather I try to stand in solidarity with, uh, with Palestinians and try to use my privilege to, to support my, my friends because they are severely underprivileged by the system that is there. But essentially here, an Israeli passport is a is a weapon because you go through, uh, like there have been many, many cases where um, me and my Palestinian friends end up in the exact same situation and they end up with way harsher consequences than I do. Uh, like I can argue with the army and there is there are limits to what they can do to me. Uh, well, now, like four days ago, those limits were broken, and the, 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 there was an unprecedented attack on, on me and my uh, journalist colleague. But uh, generally, there, there, are, there are way more limits on what the army and the police can do to Israelis um, and to internationals. Uh, while in regards to Palestinians, they can do anything. They, they can, uh, like my friends have been just taken, beaten, uh, taken to military bases, tortured. Um, then thrown on the side of the roads. Their property has been conf was confiscated, phones stolen, money stolen, uh, cars uh, broken, uh, cars sh just shot up uh, with hundreds of bullets by the by the occupation forces. And there is essentially nothing. Th there is no recourse to that. Uh, there, you can't really go to. It, in ninety nine percent of these cases, just leads to nothing. Um, so yeah, essentially, if you if you have a non-Palestinian passport, uh, it really allows you to do a lot of things to document human rights violations, to go to places, and to, in some cases prevent violence. Uh, and, and, a foreign passport is useful uh, because they they're less likely to do something to you, but they can deport you. With an Israeli passport, they can't even deport you. So so it's right. the most powerful piece of paper you can have. Uh, in this land, because we live in an apartheid state, and I am on the side of the apartheid, which where I get all the privilege. And I'm trying and to so, use them. For, to and some of the people, Andre, and some of the people who even carry U.S. Just to remind you, a U.S. citizen was killed in the West Bank recently, who was doing some of the same kind of work. She was also a Turkish citizen, but she was also a a U.S. citizen as well. My American colleague was shot in the head at a demonstration. Yes. Later, uh, there have been activists shot, killed beaten uh, it happened uh, every time there is kind of a scandal i think that there was a uh it's 
there was way less attention to Aisha's case when she was murdered uh, intentionally by the Israeli occupation forces. And that did not lead to nearly as much uh, change as, uh, as it should have. Um, at the same time, that, that goes into the news. At the same, uh, on that exact day, the occupation forces shot a 13-year-old girl, a Palestinian, and killed um, in just a few miles from, uh, from Beta, where Aisha was shot. And that barely made the news. And uh, as you said, the old, I think almost, almost a thousand Palestinians have been killed in the West Bank. Uh, and by the occupation forces and by the settlers, and the vast majority of them are, as always, unarmed civilians. And this, there, there is, even when we are attacked, beaten, killed, shot, this is nothing compared to what uh, the Palestinians go through on a daily basis. How strong is the anti Zionist movement in uh, Israel Palestine? In, among Israelis, it's uh, very, very weak. It's barely existent. There, there are a few activists. Uh, there, there are like some more dedicated activists, less dedicated activists. Some people leave the country. Some people are unable to, to, to deal with it. Uh, but in general, the movement is weak. Uh, as, as for uh, as for Palestinians, well, I think the vast majority of Palestinians are anti zionists What is the rationale of the? Jews who are anti-Zionist. Why? Wh how do they explain their anti-Zionist uh, sentiments? Uh, what is, your, Jew, what uh, is your explanation of uh, anti-Zionism? So as a Jew and as an anti-Zionist, my, my explanation is that uh, Zionism is an inherently racist system which uh, privileges one ethnic group over another. And uh, in my mind, that is completely unjustifiable. And since its inception, uh, it has been used in order to uh, perpetrate and continue oppression of, uh, of Palestinians to expel them, kill them, beat them down, uh, take their lands, take their property, and deprive the, them and their children of the future. And I, I believe that, that uh, the Zionist idea needs need to, need to go, it needs to be dismantled. And anything uh, that needs to be built here in the future needs to be built on the basis of uh, complete equality, uh, ir regardless of uh, ethnic uh, or religious background. Do you have like meetings or you discuss with each other openly or is this like uh, hush hush uh, being anti-Zionist? So that depends. There, there are a lot of different organizations. Uh, of course, there are. Some of them have more people. Some of them have fewer, fewer people. There are. Um, uh, there are essentially um, like there, there, are, there are certain repercussions um, that you have if you are an open anti-Zionist. Uh, you you lose friends. You lose like ability to to like you can lose your job and so on. But at the same time. Because this is an apartheid state, uh, if you are uh, an Israeli Jew and you're an anti-Zionist, then like you can you can still say whatever you want, and the government will is unlikely to actually punish you, put you in jail, and so on. In many other countries, that is inevitable. Like in in uh, the Russian dictatorship, if you're against the government, you will be uh, you're likely to go like you can you can go to jail just for like tweeting something. Me, for instance, here. I'm able to make my videos all I want. If uh, if I were Palestinian, I would have gone to jail long ago. But since, since I'm not, I'm uh, I'm able to do whatever I want. Sorry, no, one, one second. I'll be back in just a second. Okay. All right. Um, my next question was going to be, since he's from Russia, uh, was it possible to be anti-communist in Russia? Uh, but. <laughs> Since he's not here, uh, we'll wait for him. But in the meantime, if any of you have questions, go ahead and raise your hands and... Uh, um. Of course it was possible. There were anti-communist Russians. Openly? Mm -hmm. oh, openly Andre, were there right. openly anti-communist? Was it a movement? Was there a anti-communist movement in communist Russia? Are you asking me? Yes. Which was before his life, but okay. <laughs> that, that was, it, it depends on the period that you're speaking about. 
uh, for the for the vast majority of the um, of the Soviet period, that was not possible. At some point, you you, you could be, especially after the start of Perestroika, like you, you could be against. But also, there were the, like a lot of within within the uh, within the system, you, you like you could be advocating for different types of. Uh, so uh, was... different governments, but generally, like it, it was not a particular free society. No, like it was uh, the dissent was suppressed. Do you see a correlation between the what what I call Israel being a um, a um, a state that is um, controlled by by uh, ideology, uh, a cult? Cult, in my opinion, it's a cult. Mm -hmm. Would you say that um, Russia was also a cult in terms of communism? And do you see a parallel in terms of dismantling the cults? There is a general parallel between any uh, strong political ideology which takes over a state, uh, be that. Uh, be, be, be that uh, here, be that in Russia, be, be that in Russia currently, uh, be that with the with the rise of ultra nationalist movements in Europe uh, uh, right now, like it's it, it, it can take over. Uh, it's uh, but there are also big specificities. Like I, I wouldn't say that it's it, like you would get a lot out of uh, these kinds of comparisons. Uh, like it's it's a it, I think it would make more sense to compare the current state uh, of um, of this land with uh, with regimes that are specifically have a focus on ethnicity, like apartheid South Africa, uh, like uh, Liberia, like um, and, and on colonial regions like uh, uh, Algeria uh, and so on. Because I think that the the, the context that is most important here is not just dictatorship. And um, uh, it's not just dictatorship and like this big national idea, but uh, colonialism and apartheid. I think th these are the things that make uh, make this this conflict uh, special, especially especially given that this is like the last real settler colony that haven't been any any anything else. There hasn't been anything else started in the, in the recent decade. All right, let's go to Una and then Charles. Hello, Una, and you have a question. Uh, yes, just quickly, uh, and or, again, fantastic guy, guy this uh, Andrea, and how do you pronounce your name, Andre? Yeah, that right. Andre, uh, if you had to tell me Putin or Russia, is it pro Israel or pro Palestine? Uh, it, they, they don't care. It's just, it's, uh, <laughs> we, we live in a state of uh, just like it's, it's just they're, they're making geopolitical decisions. Currently, uh, Putin is allied with Iran, uh, and Iran is against Israel. So now they're like making moves to support Iran and like making statements about Palestinian civil rights. But it's like they, they don't care. It's, it's not re it's not relevant to the issue. Um, okay, can I you, think that yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you explain to me why then the world has become so polarized? Oh, that, that is that is a very big big question. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I, th I think that there is a general kind of uh, collapse that we're seeing and uh, with, uh, with the rise of ultra nationalists. There is a, a general crisis. Like we, we live in a, in a late, stage, late stage capitalism where we're seeing a, a big economic polarization with, uh, um, with during, for instance, COVID, so many people losing their ability to just survive. At the same time, the top companies and top richest people uh, earning an insane amount of money. Like we, we, we're living in a system which kind of leads us to a crisis. Um, and I think the political, like it's one of the reasons for political polarization, but also we have, uh, we live in an attention economy where you have to be uh, loud on the internet and say controversial stuff in order to keep, uh, keep the world's attention. And it help people who are just making quick radical statements to gain, gain a following. Um, like there is, I think there's a million reasons for that, that that will be studied over the course of the next centuries. If the next centuries happen, if, if we survive at all. All right, Charles. Thank you. 
You're amazing, Andrew. I'm totally, I am so in awe. You're so young and so a young head on old shoulders. I thank you for that. All right, let's go to Charles and then uh, Ola. No <clears throat> Andre, I, w I wonder if you could um, comment about how you would describe the uh, from my perspective i see the the russian autocracy is something that just makes use of ethno nationalism and you know reaching back to um the russian orthodoxy and the time of the czars and as well as uh various other things to cobble together uh, a russian identity that you know people can feel they're willing to go out and you know kill for uh but uh, my question is, how much penetration has that really had among the Russian public? Do are they? I, I know Putin is, you know, in total control in terms of of uh, politically. But uh, how do the people feel about the changes that have gone on? I know that democracy kind of didn't really work for a lot of different reasons, not uh, a lot of them not under the Russians' control. So how do they feel about uh, the direction that Putin's taking the country? And do you see any daylight uh, in the future in terms of Russia becoming a more open society? It's, it's a very interesting question. And there is a very interesting answer to that because there is a big difference between the ideological indoctrination by the Israeli state and by the Russian state. Uh, because here uh, we've had very strong uh, indoctrination like from, from, uh, from, from childhood essentially, from, from school into the army, which is kind of like this system of, uh, of the creation of the Israeli citizen. And uh, this national myth is... Uh, drilled into every person's psyche from, from their from early age and that's why we, we have a very high uh, level of nationalism here uh, but among the uh, but in Russia that hasn't really been the case until essentially 2022 the start of the war because for the first 20 years of uh, Putin's rule and he was uh, first uh, in power in uh, in the year 2000 there wasn't the, the goal of the Russian state wasn't to get all the Russians on board with some national project. It was more so to get the Russians out of politics as much as possible, so that the ruling class, the, 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 the bureaucracy, and the oligarchs are able to do their thing, and the, the Russian population just doesn't get involved. So what, it was a big project of depoliticizing the Russian population, and essentially trying to, um, I think it, by some sociologists, it was described as like trying to make a deal with the Russians that the state will provide you an okay standard of living, which was back then fueled by high oil prices. And in exchange, the Russian population just doesn't get involved in, the, in state affairs, it just doesn't get involved in politics. And it's, it, it worked. It was um, the attitude that you would uh, get uh, until recently. And even now, I think that you will get that from, from a, lot, a lot of people is, well, politics is not for us. We're little people. We just need to do our thing. And they upstairs, they will, they, they know what they're doing. They'll figure it out. Um, but once the, uh, once the full scale invasion of Ukraine uh, was launched, all of that changed and the national idea changed a lot. And, and uh, it, it changed even, even earlier with the, with first with the occupation of uh, Crimea and the Donbass, the Donbass region. Um, it, uh, but now it's, it's, got, it's gone into overdrive and suddenly the Russian state does want a national idea. They do want people to be on board with their project and their project is like a mix of like the old imperial idea of the rebuilding the empire and uh, with some like red stars painted on top because they pretend that they're like supporting all the people and in some ways they're like utilizing the Russian nationalism uh, of uh, of like Dugin, who is uh, one of uh, Putin's uh, favorite uh, quote unquote philosophers. On the other hand, they're like trying to pretend to be um, internationalist and like oh, there are so many nations, but all one. It's it's kind of this uh, 
insane mix of things, but generally it's the words like, oh, we, we are a fortress which is under siege by the horrible, horrible Western powers and we're fighting against them. Uh, it, it's our last stand for pick one, for the Russian Empire, for religion, for whatever. Um, but it hasn't, like, this, this just began. So the vast majority of people uh, are, like, not nearly as on board with this as the Israelis are with the Zionist project. Because here the Israelis view from childhood, there since 2022. Thank you. Um, Joseph had to step out for a second. He should be back. So I'm going to manage the questions. Um, Andre, are you good on time? Are you good? Uh, sure. Okay. Uh, so we're going to go to Ola and then uh, after Giacomo. Go ahead, Ola, with your question. Charles, there's kind of static from your end. Can you mute? I think it's... Hi. Hi. How are you? Uh, Andre, I've been uh, following you and I uh, commend you on, uh, on your work. And uh, my question is, in, in your opinion, um, how can we amplify your voice here for, uh, or maybe you have an idea, <laughs> Um, of amplifying your voice that, you know, being that you're on the ground to our local politicians here. Uh, is here USA? Them... Is here yeah, USA? Here okay. USA yeah. to make them change uh, their thinking. Uh, what ideas do you have for us to be able to do that? Uh, I mean, generally, uh, and I would I would suggest amplifying the voices of uh, many Palestinian journalists that work in the West Bank as well. I'm I kind of got big for for a variety of reasons. One of which is that I just like uh, I'm a white kid who speaks English, so it's easier to relate to me than to Palestinians but for a lot of Western audiences. Um, but also, it's it's not really a question for me because like my area of expertise is different. My area of expertise is like knowing what's happening on the ground and managing it and, and doing stuff in that regard. Uh, but also, um, but in general, what people are asking questions is what, what can I do? How, how can we, how can we help? How can we enact change? Uh, it's all the standard things that, uh, the, the protest movements do. It's writing letters. It's going to protest. It's uh, sometimes escalating these protests. Um, it's getting more people on the ground, edu educating, talking to your friends and spreading awareness and information, agitating people towards uh, direct action, towards boycotts, towards, uh, towards everything. There is, there, is, there, is, there is a million tools. Uh, some of them will work, some of them won't, but it's, it's all about, uh, you know, w working, on, uh, uh, working on a comprehensive uh, comprehensive way of uh, uh, of enacting change what's what will actually work I don't know but we've had some we've had some successes there, there was a, there were a lot of the uh, there was a lot of success with pressure on the Israeli government at some point to allow more aid through and at some point a lot of aid started going through specifically because of the international pressure um, there is, and in general, there have been a lot of positive. There has been a lot of positive change due to due to pressure from the West, and whatever can be done in that direction is good. But but also, I'm not the exact person to ask about this because I my, my job is just like reporting from the ground. I, I do a different thing. Right. I mean, we're trying to amplify your voice. Uh, we share things. Um, in in your perspective, from your work that you are doing on the ground. Um, is do you feel that the the overall Israeli society like can you give us an idea of how they perceive Palestinians? How do they feel about Palestinians? Um, you know, this is really important to understand, like how we can change people's minds and hearts. Like, what are you seeing now on the ground? Uh, first of all, I don't think that any significant change will be enacted just by, you know, convincing Zionists not to be Zionists. Uh, I think that the real change is going to have to come from the outside, unfortunately, due to the decades of indoctrination uh, and the fact that a lot of people are on board with this. A lot of people are voting for Smotrich, Ben Gvir, uh, Netanyahu and other fascist forces uh, uh, in this country. And... Um, I think that <clears throat> I've, in general, lately, I've kind of stopped speaking to, to uh, uh, stop spending a lot of time speaking to people who uh, who think that uh, Palestinians should all be killed because I, I just don't really see any point in that. Uh, but 
if you speak to liberals, the majority, like, I think the most common opinion you're going to have is that, oh, yes, I want peace. I want everybody to live together. But how can we do But how can we do it? We have no choice. We have to have an army. This army has to do this, this and that for security. And there is no recognition of the fact that the, the violence that is enacted uh, by by uh, by Palestinian resistance is is the response. It's the inevitable response to the colonial violence that is enacted um, by Israel, and um, you, and you will have right wingers who think that all Palestinians should be killed or expelled or something, uh, and you will have a small sliver of the population that doesn't that that that, that wants to fight against that and, uh, believes believes that. Uh, this needs to be done completely differently. So in your opinion, you really feel like that most Israelis are completely disconnected from Palestinians, even though they're like 10 minutes away from each other. I mean, it seems that way from what you're saying. Like, they, it's like, there's people there, but we don't know who they are. We don't care. You know, let them all die. Like, I mean, this is what I'm hearing you say. Am I correct? I mean, that's kind of scary, actually. A lot of it is we don't care. A lot of it is, yes, we want peace. There are people, and uh, I'm so sad that children are dying, but what else can we do? Um, which is, uh, which is I, I think that it's a very common uh, take in general during war, because you hear that a lot from Russians as well. It's like, oh, yeah, yes, right. the Ukrainians, they, like, I empathize with them, they're brothers, blah, blah, blah. But what else can we do? There are Nazis, whatever. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of... The, the take of but we yes i want all the good things but we have no other choice as a, uh, other than to do all the bad things i think it's a very <laughs> common thing um that's hilarious i think i think that that's that, that's the one that you'll hear the most joseph uh you want you want to take it back no go ahead go ahead okay I, I so he, and i asked i asked andre he's cool with staying staying on he's he's good on time uh giacomo and then um I don't so, want to slaughter your name, Fumi. I'm Fumi. Sorry. Fumi Hiko. I'm sorry. I just have, can I just have, ask one last question? I'm really sorry. This is my train of thought. So, do you really think um, that all this work, that everything we're trying to do, uh, the only way to enact change is if it's forced by the United States? Is that the way you think things will change? Is if it's if it's forced to forced to happen? I think that it's very. Um... I think that it's very difficult to predict these kind of things, and I, and even if they're possible to predict, then I'm the wrong person to ask. I'm a field reporter. I go to places to make videos, just showing what's on the ground. I can like give my thoughts on the situation, given the information that I have on the ground. But like it's it's very difficult to tell what actual uh, like thing will bring bring in change, especially given that Israel Palestine is. The, Complete is a completely unique situation. There is there is nothing really that that looks the same, uh, the same way. There are like there are there are, there are cases with similarities, but they're still different. Um, what what will actually bring change in the ground? I I don't know. Uh, but I feel like the thing that we can, the thing that can be most effective, um, at the moment is yes, cutting off. Uh, aids uh, cutting off the, the supply of money and guns to enact the genocide in gaza and the ethnic cleansing in the west bank could i interrupt oh. here but in before the two gentlemen have their hands up because i sure. wanted to comment exactly on this conversation all this question and your response andre do you is that okay with you yeah yeah go ahead go ahead libby because you, you haven't uh, had a chance to speak go ahead I've been part of a Jewish-Palestinian living room dialogue here in California for 32 years. And we say an enemy is one whose story you have not heard. And the thing that we know must take place and must uh, take be in action is for the grassroots people to stand together and work together and create together. And there are many groups in Israel, Palestine, and Andre, you probably are aware of them, like Combatants for Peace and AllMEP and, and uh, the Bereaved Parents and 
schools that already have Jewish Palestinian students coming together. There are so many things that are happening, but they need incredible support. And that group of people, that grassroots groups of people need to grow so that they can support something like this confederation we're talking about or whatever the new form comes, whether it's two state or states or one state. And I had a, a Palestinian friend who is very involved in all of this, just participated in talks in New York and Washington and now went to Germany, who's in Hebron. And she works with Search for Common Ground. And she was just here last weekend with me and we had lots of serious talks. And she did make it clear, this is her opinion based on her experience, that the role the United States plays is indeed critical. And our support behind Israel is has been very counterproductive to stopping the war. We are supplying lots of weapons. We are, and even though we say cease the cease fire, we there's still this feeling, this power, this uh support, the um um, I forget what you call the the group that goes into Washington and and talks our senators and our representatives into supporting Israel. It's APAC, very the APAC, lobby, the Jewish lobby is APAC, very, very APAC, APAC. So we APAC, yeah, APAC. so we really have work to do here in America on two fronts. One is making sure we try to get our elected officials to understand the big picture and what we want and we need to build the grassroots activities and if we're if we can be supportive send money to those groups that are working together to create a vision that works for everybody so um i think everything you said andre i i appreciate it very much and we do have work to do that is for sure That's thank you for I, I, I have a lot of respect for activists that work in uh, uh, in these communities, and I have friends uh, who who are working in combatants for peace and in, in other peace building projects. And I think that it is valuable. At the same time, I believe that uh, the the biggest problem that is m most urgent to solve in Israel Palestine is not the problem of peace building, but a problem of dismantling the system of oppression. And I think that peace building cannot cannot physically be done. Uh, until, uh, like, it cannot be done under Zionism. Yes. And yes. Zionism needs to be dismantled first, then we can do peace building. Uh, but, like, it's right now, the, all those organizations, I think, are doing a lot of uh, good stuff in, uh, uh, in, like, setting the ground for the future work of uh, building cooperation and uh, working together and so on. Uh, yeah. and, and building enough people to dismantle the, the politics. Sure. Both in. Yeah, no, I 100%, Andre. Uh, go ahead, G uh, um, Giacomo. Go ahead. Uh, yes, my maybe one of, one of my comments was is a little bit uh, goes back to when we were talking about Russia. Uh, as, as an Italian, I was born in Italy, and uh, uh, when I grew up, uh, I studied and learned about uh, fascism, the experience of fascism in Italy. And I think today's Russia reminds me a lot of what I have been reading about fascism in Italy in the 1930s and 40s, um, um, 20s and 30s. Um, so, but then another comment I wanted to make about uh, uh, the difficulty in dealing with Israel now is a little bit similar to what's happening in Europe with Hungary. Hungary has a uh, president, uh, a prime minister who is so-called elected, uh, Viktor Orban, um, he basically is a is kind of Netanyahu. And the, the, the challenge of the EU is dealing with him, just like uh, the US now has to deal with uh, with Netanyahu. So I just wanted to throw out this, this little comment. Um, and um, it is very difficult to deal with these people because they use prevarication, um, corruption, and, uh, and a mix of uh, and politic political expediency to always prevail and, and, and come, come ahead. So uh, I don't know what can be done 
it is a question of power politics and not only a grassroots movement to deal with these people. Anyway, just that. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's a global problem now with the rise of right-wing populists who are either are fascists or are allied with fascists. You could start by cutting the funds. We are complicit in the genocide of Palestinians. The US is complicit and the UK and Germany. So this is, I think, essential. So I greatly respect what, what the work Libby has done and, oh, and the wonderful work you yourself are doing. It's absolutely wonderful. But the bottom line is we are complicit in the genocide of Palestinians. We are fund, co-funding it. And that, to me, I, I, I can't swallow that morally. It's a huge moral issue. Morality has gone out the window, unfortunately. Thank you, Andrea. You're wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mori, would you like to yeah. ask a question? Uh, actually, so thank you for sharing us uh, a lot of, you know, kind of, you know, interesting you know story your experience andre and thank you very much and but you no know, i'm you also mentioned that uh, something about the internet we need more international pressure do you have any concrete example what can can you know countries do it's more not it's now these days it's there's no more regional you know conflict that because you know, Israel expand the war conflict the to Syria and Lebanon, okay, and so other countries. And then so it's more and more global. And then so what kind of pressure, you know, uh, international, you know, community, international, you know, the pressure can yeah, I, I, cause I know I know, I know it sounds uh, abstract. I can give you an, excuse me, I can give you an, a kind of an example. Is there any country which does not allow, okay, Israeli who are, who killed, okay, and Palestinian, especially women, children, okay, and just the, the, those who got involved in genocidal, you know, act are not allowed to enter into our country, for example. So that kind of, is there any country like that now? No, uh, it's, it, I'm guessing because it would be very difficult to actually establish and police and enforce. But there are a lot of countries that don't let Israelis in at all. Of course, it goes uh, beyond that, okay, grassroots you know, movement, but you no, know, I think a yeah, country sure. can do that, right? It's it. I, th I think that a specific idea like that would be difficult to actually enforce because, like you, a, lo a lot of the, like it, it's it's impossible to tell if you are just you know a, a country and you have an Israeli citizen coming in. It's impossible mm -hmm. to tell who was involved in the uh, in the genocide and not involved and the extent of their involvement and so on. In general, sanctions on top level politicians and uh, you know leaders of the economy, whatever, it's yeah, they are useful. And uh, tar targeted sanctions, targeted economic sanctions and boycotts and divestment mm -hmm. has been uh, has shown success. Uh, a couple of months ago, the port of Eilat uh, had to declare bankruptcy because there were just weren't mm -hmm. enough ships coming in because of the boycotts and because of the because of the action of uh, of the people in the West. Uh, and it's it, it's as I said, I know it sounds abstract pressure from the from uh, from uh, like international pressure, but. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's because it is abstract until until it's concrete because you don't know what will actually work. So you do everything and you hope that like specific things will have effect. Uh, but in general, yeah, boycotts, sanctions, divestments, convincing politicians mm -hmm. to cut ties, uh, convincing like electing politicians who will not uh, support mm -hmm. the genocide and who will try to fight against it, making that uh, the biggest and most important issue. Uh, in in your whatever electoral district, mm -hmm. uh, and like there there are a lot of uh, a lot of ways, and mm -hmm. as with any strategy, ninety percent of it will, will fail, but everything will depend on the other ten. Okay, so before I finish it up, okay, just I would like to ask one more question. I think you may have heard about the kind of the breaking news, okay, in Japan, okay, and. Uh, okay, 
uh, atomic bomb, okay, uh, Japanese Atomic Bomb Association, okay, was given a no award, peace, Nobel Peace Prize. Have you heard about it? Just in a couple no, of days, um, couple of days ago. Mm. It was uh, in Japan. It was a big, big news, and that's uh, just in a, okay. But just nineteen. All I think those victims. I think most of them already passed away, so at the age of around ninety, and so most of them, you know, passed away. Okay, died, and but you no, know, I was really uh, happy to see young generation. Okay, just in the takeover what they have been doing, okay? Because you know, those old people go, who know they will die soon. So that's why. And then, so that's an atomic bomb, okay? In Hiroshima and Nagasaki, okay? And then, so those, okay, I don't know. What the, it, I'm just more, I'm just uh, interested in about the timing. Time, this organization got the Nobel Peace Prize. Okay, and then so that's an, a nuclear weapon, okay, atomic bomb. That's really, really something. And so just uh, I'd like to know if there's a kind of uh, that kind of news, okay, can give a kind of impact on the way Israeli as well as Palestinian think about the peace on earth so iran celebrated it by deploy detonating a nuclear bomb a few days ago so right right okay. so i guess it doesn't matter to anyone doesn't you... matter anymore doesn't affect any no it do i mean i wish it did you know because nukes uh -huh. are dangerous as hell but uh it, instead uh regimes keep racing to get them especially mm -hmm. rogue regimes like iran north korea you know, mm -hmm. they, uh, despite all the damage, despite all the destruction it caused in Japan, it doesn't seem like anybody learned the lesson. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, is, is, uh, Libby, do you have another question or you're, is, cause your hand is raised? Oh, no. And then Mr. Moore's done. Okay. Oren, did you have a question? Your hand is raised. Uh, I think this is going to uh, be the last one because we're kind of, I, I don't, I, I think I'd just like to up. correct the record. Um, there is sure. no evidence that Iran has detonated a nuclear bomb according to NBC. Okay. Oren, did you have a question for the guest or comment? Um, Cause you have your hand raised. What, I'm, I'm what's the, you. what's the, who's the, so the, I, I missed part of it because I, I had another call. Well, you have your you, you have your hand raised. Was there a reason why you have your hand that. raised? Do you, are you did you have a question? Uh, so the guest is 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 lived in Israel for how long now? Almost three years now. For three years now, and you've become an activist based on living here. Uh yeah yeah. What uh, what in, what in particular inspired you to to be an activist? <laughs> uh, I there are two two main reasons. One is that uh, seeing everything that's happening here, having spoken to Palestinians and to Israelis and to uh, in, in in general, just going around the West Bank in forty eight and uh, you know reading more on the history of the conflict. Uh, I feel like it's a moral obligation, and by coming here as uh, on on the so-called uh, repatriation program, you become a part of a certain system. You become you, you become a beneficiary and in some way a contributor of uh, of the Israeli apartheid. And to an extent, I think that you have a moral obligation to do something about it. Uh, the other reason is that I think I'm pretty good at it. And I think that I can have a positive impact. And I think that uh, I, I can have more of an impact by staying here and doing activism than just, I don't know, leaving or doing nothing. And uh, I'm just trying to do wherever I am, uh, whatever whatever I can do in order to have the most positive impact. 
Thank you. So, so can you we go, feel by you feel okay, by no, running Oren, out of Oren, we here, have two more evil? people. We have two more people who are asking questions, and we're really cut on time. So you asked your two questions. We're gonna go on. Mike Smith and and Andrea will be the last two questions. Go ahead, Mike Smith. Yeah, thank you, Andre, for for your work. Um, as an Israeli citizen now, are you subjected to the IDF draft? Uh, no, I was. Uh, I got my passports when I was, uh, I think, twenty three or twenty two. Anyway, I was. I was older than the, the, like for bureaucratic reasons, no. But if I were subject to the draft, I would refuse. And uh, I have friends who spent uh, just now six months in jail for refusing to, uh, to be drafted into the occupation forces. Thank you, Andre. I'm following you on Twitter now. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Andrea, you're the last one. Go ahead. Um, so if we um, pressure our governments, like the U.S. government, to stop uh, sending arms, but we do it in a way that is an alliance of Palestinians and um, American Jews or Israeli Jews who basically, you know, are not anti Zionists, they, that's not the mainstream, but, you know, basically they want to live in Israel with an Israeli and a Palestinian state and want an end to occupation. If they, we, if we form an alliance to approach our governments um, uh, like that, you know, would that be helpful? Because, you know, what I see is too much kind of, it's binary, is either you're pro-Palestinian or pro-Israel, um, you know, in, in, in the United States. But we need to, you know, if we form an alliance to approach the politicians together and say, no, this is not bringing safety for anybody, we want a different future like what you just discussed in um your your uh your federation uh discussion would that be much more helpful yes uh, <laughs> i'm sure it would i'm sure it would be great and it's it's good to build alliances with all kinds of people i think that this is uh, this is not so much a fight between uh like i don't know between israelis and uh um, and Palestinians, it's, it's a fight between people who are trying to um, people who are trying to build something, you know, a, an equitable future for the for this land, and people who are trying to enforce uh, ethnic supremacy. And uh, it's it, 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 I think that it's definitely good to just uh, build an alliance with. Uh, with whoever is able to stand stand on that side, appeal to the to the governments with yeah with with everybody who who can join need everybody's help. There is a genocide going on, and we need to do everything to stop it. All right, All right. go ahead, uh, Nasir. You want to conclude? Uh... No, I want to thank Andre for his participation, um, and thank you for staying the extra time. We appreciate it, and uh, definitely enjoyed the chat. Thank the participants who uh, participated today and helped us with the simulation. And I, I'm not good at closing statements, Joseph. You go ahead. <laughs> well, I already made the closing oh, statement. Okay. But, but the yeah. closing statement is that a federal government is a possibility. Could you grab my, it is my very book? likely it could Thanks. be created with very little uh, effort, relative effort especially if you compare it to the amount of energy being spent on, on these um, preposterous wars that are going on. And uh, please continue to support us. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Free Palestine. Merci. 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 André, you are, Thank tu, you. Tu, tu es incroyable, André. Bravo. Bravo. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Joseph. Merci, Joseph. Thank you, Una. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thanks. <laughs> Bye. -bye. <laughs>